So everything is coming down. I hate to be chicken little and bear of bad news, but that's why on my tweet, I was begging people, you got to change your thinking. You know, get rid of those, that mantra, go to school, get a job, work hard, buy stocks and bonds, save cash. Three times, Andy Sheckman, the smartest guy I know, a three times crash is coming. First of all, all paper assets. Second, real estate. Third, cash is trash. I hope I'm wrong. Our debt to GDP, you know, in 2008, wasn't that bad. And then after when it crashed, then Bernanke started printing, you know, they call it quantitative easing. It's printing money. And so uh, that's why in 2013, I wrote the book, Rich Dad's Prophecy, to warn people that the crash was going to get bigger. In 2013, I wrote that book, and it's going to get bigger because the debt to GDP, David, as most people know, is 130 debt to GDP. It's the biggest in world history. Our debt is through the roof, and Powell is raising interest rates, which makes that debt more expensive. Hey, it's Evan Carmichael, and I make these videos because as a young entrepreneur, I struggled to keep my business going. I had no friends, I had no mentors, I had no role models. And the thing that saved me was learning from the success stories of famous entrepreneurs. And in their stories, I got motivation, and I also got strategies for what I could do to grow my business and not stay stuck. And I still need their stories for motivation today. So today, let's learn from one of the best, Robert Kiyosaki, and some of his amazing inspiration. Enjoy. Let me give some dates, but in 1974 was the deal was cut that the world would have to buy oil in U.S. dollars. Correct. And that's what um, Andy's talking about is all, they're all saying right now, adios dollars. And Andy's saying 60% today of the world's population will stop using the U.S. dollar. And that's what gives us power. So those of you who are saving those fake dollars, you're in serious trouble right now. And that's why what Andy says, and, and Kim will back me up for all these years, we don't save dollars. We save gold coins and silver coins stored someplace else because that is the challenge with gold and silver is the storage. So I want you to understand this. This goes back to what they always say at school. Go to school, get a good job work hard, pay taxes, and uh, save money and invest in the stock market. And that's what we're talking about now. That dollar gave it the power to the stock market to go through the roof. And when they talk about the, you know, the bubble, the three times bubble, it's stocks, paper assets, real estate, and the dollar is going to crash. So all you out there savers out there, I would pay attention right now. Because if you still think, you're still believing in the power of the dollar, you're in serious trouble. Don't teach pigs to sing. It wastes your time. It annoys the pig. If you're talking to pigs at home, don't teach them to sing because it wastes your time. They still believe in going to school, getting a job, saving money, paying taxes, getting out of debt, and investing in a 401k or an IRA. They're going to be the biggest losers today. I mean, it's already they've already started to lose if you look at the stock market. And they're going to try and curb inflation. But as you know, they're raising interest rates, which is not going to solve it. It's going to make it worse. So if you really want a real education, you can go back to college, get in student loan debt, and wonder what happened to your life because you're still saving money and investing in a 401k. I mean, that's the most stupid thing you can do right now. What would financial education in school look like for you? What would you like to have learned? Well, it was really simple because my poor dad, I finally bugged him enough, you know, I said, well, what am I going to learn about money? He said, why don't you ask your best friend's father, my classmate? And that was Mike in the book. I had to change his name for the, the family doesn't want to be known. Of course. And I uh, said, so why does Mike, why does Mike's father know about money? My rich dad's, my poor dad said, because he's an entrepreneur. Mm. I'm like, what's that? And, and what are you? He says, I'm an employee. I'm only nine years old. I'm learning two new words, employee and entrepreneur. I went, what? What's the difference, you know? And then my poor dad says, well, an entrepreneur must know about money. An entrepreneur must speak the language of money. I went, what? And then my poor dad says, and what, I said, what are you? He says, I'm a school teacher. I'm an employee. And what about you? Why don't you have to learn to speak to mo about money? He says, because all I want is a paycheck and a pension, paychecks and pensions. So that's kind of the, you know, I'm nine years old. I am totally confused now. So I go across town. It's a little dinky little sugar plantation town. Like I said, my classmates own the plantations and the kids across the street at union school, all union members, they worked for the plantations. 
and my other you know, son going, I'm poor. So I sat down with my rich dad, who never went to school, ironically, and um, he wouldn't teach me about money either. And he kept rejecting me. I didn't realize it was part of the process. Mm. He wanted to find out how badly I wanted to learn. And he says, and as we all know as entrepreneurs, right, salesmanship begins when the customer says no. And so the more he said no, the more I got in. I said, well, and so I, I kept, you know, going back to talk to him and all. He says, get out of here, kid. So that was test number one from my rich dad. Test number two was as if, if I teach you, you have to work for me for free. And I said, why for free? He says, because if I pay you, you'll think like your dad, poor dad. The rich don't work for money. So if you read Rich Dad, Poor Dad, which is right there, the rich don't work for money. And then I'm, all, I'm now all confused as a nine-year-old kid. And so that's when the whole thing started about financial education. For me, I was, I was coming out of the Marine Corps in 74. And I said to my rich dad, I wanted to be an entrepreneur. And because my poor dad wanted me to get my PhD, of course, fly for the airlines to get a PhD. I'm going, oh my God, you know, my old man was broke. Poor, poor dad was broke because he ran for lieutenant governor of the state of Hawaii and dirtiest business there is, is politics. And the governor said to my dad, poor dad, he says, you'll never work in this state again. And my poor dad went poor. I mean, up, up until that time, he was okay. But once he could not work, then he couldn't sell. And so I come out of the Marine Corps, and he's telling me, oh, go fly for the airlines. United Airlines is hiring. And go back to school and get your PhD like me. And I said, that's what my saying is PhD stands for poor, helpless, and desperate. Jesus, I mean, he couldn't sell. So I go to a rich dad, and he, I go, what should I do? I'm being an entrepreneur. He says, got to sell. I'm going, oh, my God. Oh, my God, that's the worst thing possible. This is 1974. And because <clears throat> my old man, poor dad, kept saying, he says, salesman of the scum, you know, da, 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 da. And so I said, hey, rich dad, why do I have to sell? He says, how's your sex life? I says, terrible. He says, because you can't sell, <laughs> you know? <laughs> So I got a job with Xerox in Honolulu, and I went to see, I had to go home to my poor dad and apologize. I said, I'm a disappointment to you because I got a job as a salesman. And that's when it started, you know, and it was horrible, you know. Knocking on doors. Knocking on doors, and if you don't sell, you don't eat. Also, to make sure you're actually taking action after watching this video, I've designed a special free worksheet just for this video. The worksheet will highlight all of the lessons learned in this video, as well as pull out our three favorite learnings and quotes that will inspire you to actually do something. The worksheet will also give you space to write down what your key takeaways are and your specific plan of action to make sure you're getting results. If you want the worksheet designed specifically for this video, absolutely for free, there's a link in the description below. Go click on it and start building the momentum in your life and your business. I'll see you there. Is the Fed yes. doing what it can in your view, or is there a different way to combat uh, inflation? Well, I would say it's not what the Fed's going to do, it's what are you going to do? And so I always talk about the four G's that I've been, I've been investing in for most of my life. The first G is gold. You know, this is gold and then this is silver here. And I stay away from the SLVs or the GLDs. I want no counterparty risk. I want the real stiff. The other thing I'm investing is ground. I own apartment houses. I'm glad I'm not in office buildings or commercial real estate. <laughs> and then gasoline. You know, gasoline... You know, the, green, the greenies hate the thing, but that's how we fly our planes and stuff like this. And then the last one is food. I invest in cattle and uh, food. So I just stay in things that as inflation goes up, <clears throat> gold goes up, uh, real estate goes up, gasoline goes up, and food goes up. So I invest with the inflation, not against it. I meet so many people who say, well, I can't afford this, I can't afford that. I can't afford to buy real estate. I can't afford to buy Bitcoin. I can't afford to buy. Well, the reason you can't afford to buy something is because you can't sell. And sales equals income. So back in 1974, you know, my, my dad wanted me to go to the University of Hawaii and get my PhD. 
And I said, no, I'm going to, or he wanted to fly for the airlines because of the pilot. And I said, no, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to learn how to sell. And it was, he was, up my, he was upset. He said, you know, salesmen are, salesmen are crooks, they're con artists. You know, it's not, it's not a very honorable profession. But that's why he was poor. You know, so many PhD types, academic types, they think they're above the capitalist process. process. They think their PhD entitles them to the better life. But if you go for your PhD, you really don't have the skill sets to be in the capitalist world. You know, like when my, my father, you know, bless his heart, he ran for lieutenant governor against his boss, the governor, as a Republican in the People's Republic of Hawaii. You know, Hawaii is 100% communist. And um, so he ran as a Republican and he lost. And the governor said to him, you'll never work in this state again. So the power the governor had over my dad was his job. And the hardest thing for a school teacher, Patrick, is you, as a capitalist, you really don't need a school teacher. You need a salesman. And my father just couldn't sell. He wouldn't, you know, he, he just kept holding up his PhD. I have mm. a PhD, but he couldn't sell. Wow. And you know what I mean? And, and I saw that. And that's when my uh, rich dad, who had no education at all, said, um, you better learn how to sell pretty quickly. So John and I, like, like I said, rugby players, believe for the Hawaii, Hawaii Harlequins rugby team. And I'm talking to him and he's telling me about all the rich people we knew in Hawaii mm -hmm. who are going broke. I'm going, you gotta tell that story. Because as I said, I, you know, in 1974 was the first uh, 401k. It was called ERISA, Employee Retirement Income Security Act. And I was still in the Marine Corps, and I was flying out of Hawaii, um, and I went to listen to these pitches on how to sell a 401k, and I said, these guys are lying through their teeth. Because the advantage I had is I had a rich dad and I had a poor dad. And my poor dad was the village idiot, and he was a PhD, which stands for poor, helpless, and desperate. He ran the school system for the state of Hawaii, and he thought the 401k was wonderful. I'm going, you gotta be kidding me. And my rich dad was my best friend's father. He goes, oh my God, boy, talk about a license to steal money from stupid people called employees. So I came from a different, so this is 74, I'm still in the Marine Corps. And the first thing my rich dad said to me, if you're gonna be a rich man, you better learn two things right now. Be an entrepreneur, you know, but he says you've got to learn how to sell. And secondly, you've got to know real estate because real estate is debt and taxes. And that's, what, what do you mean debt and taxes? So in 1974, I took my first real estate course and poof, opened my eyes up because you don't need money to buy real estate and you pay no taxes on top of it. So just before I get out of the Marine Corps, you know, I get a job with Xerox to learn how to sell. So I got sales and then I understood real estate. So why am I a rich man today? because I took two courses, learn how to sell and learn about real estate. And my poor dad, the PhD, says, go back to school, get your MBA and get your PhD. And I'm going, then I'd wind up like you, a poor, highly educated man with a 401k. Humans learn by making mistakes. You know, God designed us. So when a baby learns to walk, baby crawls, stands up and falls, stands up and falls, then finally takes the first step and the next thing, running, then flying. But what our schools do, when a child falls, they punish them. You're stupid. You make mistakes. Smart people don't make mistakes. And when, the way, when I look at the way humans are designed to learn, we're designed to learn from mistakes. So that's why you can't, you know, you play golf. I'm sure Tiger Woods has hit more bad shots than me. <laughs> He's failed more than me. So when you look at the real reality of the world, the biggest failures are the most successful. You know, like, what's his name? Uh, Steve Jobs never went to, you know, he dropped out of, I don't know, uh, Reed College. Gates dropped out of Harvard. Michael Dell at the University of Texas. But they failed their way to success. But our academics say, that's greedy. They're capitalists. Don't make mistakes and do as I tell you. Do as I tell you. And don't question anything I say. That's called tyranny. And I really want to talk to you about the most important subject for all of us today, rich, young, poor, old. It's called financial education. 
And as you know, our school systems teach us nothing about money. Nothing. It's pathetic. You know, they have financial literacy courses today. Well, that's not financial education. You know, it's really pathetic. And what's happening for most people today is, you know, they follow that age-old mantra, go to school. What do you learn about money at school? Nothing. Get a job. Well, jobs are disappearing. Not only that, is that with artificial intelligence and G5 coming, more jobs are going to be wiped out. Plus, with driverless cars, more jobs are getting wiped out. So why would you go to school to get a job? And then work hard for money but pay, and pay taxes. Taxes are going to keep going up, sports fans. They have to. Somebody's going to pay off this massive mountain of debt stacking up all over the world. And the only way they pay off debt is via taxes. And then they tell you to get out of debt. Oh, God. Debt is money. Please understand me. In 1971, when Nixon took the dollar off the gold standard, money became debt. So the rich know how to use debt to get rich. There are many, many people who always tell you, live below your means. Well, that's not a rich dad philosophy either. I think if you live below your means, and if you, especially if you're poor already, you live below the means, your spirit dies. So what the rich dad company is really about is how do you improve your spirit by increasing your financial intelligence or your financial IQ. Instead of living below my means, or what most people have as a J-O-B, a job, you can only work so hard. So my goal, my wife's goal every single year, is we increase our assets. So we buy more rental property, we invest in oil, gold, stocks that pay dividends and all this. So every year, our income or our cash flow keeps increasing. Every year, our goal is not to get a higher paying job. Our, our goal is to keep inc increasing our assets. We want you to have all the wonderful things this world has to offer. So that's one of the difference between don't live below your means. I, we used to say, what we say at Rich Dad is increase your means and you can have anything you like. And that's what makes the Rich Dad Company's philosophy a little different than the rest. The big mistake that people make is they, they, they say this, these words here. Sales and marketing, it's inaccurate. Again, it's the power of the word, okay? The real thing that I was trained as, the way it really goes is first it goes PR, it's really a philosophy above it. So PR is public relations. PR is when I'm in the, like I'll be in Newsweek next week, Time Magazine next week. I fly to New York on Tuesday to do a television show with a um, web broadcast with Steve Forbes. I'm coming out with a book with Donald Trump and things like that, it's all PR stuff. Marketing is kind of the spreadsheet between it. You know, marketing plans, testing and all that. It's like an accounting spreadsheet. And then there's a sale. So in t when times get really, really tough, what's the first thing that most businesses cut back on? PR, marketing, so they have no sales. It's really stupid. So what we're doing in our company is we're upping it 10 times. Okay. So Mike, so I, I went and I spent four years learning how to sell. The reason I, I recommend network marketing is if you can't sell, you can't do the rest of the stuff. It's all right? That's why I recommend it. Okay, you've got to know how to communicate today. People who are poor cannot communicate. Okay? So I spent four years here and I found that I sucked at it. <laughs> really terrible. But I went from the worst salesman to number one just by sheer determination overcoming my fear, my embarrassment, and I get my feedback, my stats. And pretty soon I was making more in a month than most people were making in a year. That was the thing. And the biggest thing I learned about sales was the reason most people aren't successful is they haven't failed enough times. 
So for me to become sex successful at sales, when I worked for Xerox, I was making about four sales calls a day. I, you know, I'd dial for an appointment and I'd go in, they'd say no, and I'd go eat lunch. And I'd go back in, they'd say no, I'd eat lunch. I'd go in, say no, I'd eat lunch. I gained 40 pounds. <laughs> And I talked to my rich dad, I said, why am I failing at sales? He says, because you're not failing enough. He says, if you want to be successful in life, you have to step up your failure rate. So, <clears throat> so at night, I would leave the Xerox office about six and I'd go across town to a nonprofit and I'd dial for dollars. And I wanted to get 30 no's a night as fast as I could. And the more I failed, the more my sales went up. Does that make sense, you guys here? Yeah. Hello? Yes. I went, wow. So the reason most people are not successful is because they haven't failed enough. So please discuss that really quick. It doesn't make a difference what it is. It could be golf, tennis, sales, marketing, anything. Language of money is a very good, you know the definition of the word. So. And the good thing about it is you want to be rich, just learn the like, just speak the language of money. Like if I wanted to go to, let's say Spain, I would learn Spanish. I'm Jap fourth generation Japanese. I want to go to Japan, I learn Japanese. But when you go to a school system, you learn the language of a school teacher. Go to school, get a job, work hard, save money, pay taxes, get out of debt, and buy a house because it's an asset. But all you have to do is learn the words. So my poor dad called his house an asset. Mm -hmm. And my rich dad said, your house is a liability. Again, it's just the power of words and language. So the difference between rich people and poor people are words. And words are free. And when I say that, and it <clears throat> naturally it upsets the school teachers who are mostly, I'm not, they're not bad people. When I was in 1965, I read the Communist Manifesto by Marx. And as I read, the, I went to military school in New York. And reading the book, I realized, my God, my family's communist. Wow. So they believed in taxes. Uh, they believed in, you know, they abolished real estate. You know, today, Klaus Schwab says, you will have nothing and you'll be happy. That's all communist manifesto stuff. This past week, it seems like the big banks are going to get bigger, despite everything the administration really hopes happens here. You know, a, a, can you just talk about whether these trends, you, when you say it comes back to us and what we're doing, but are some of the things that you or that the others are doing making it worse for the guy who's just trying to, to get ahead? Well, I'm a big advocate for financial education. So in the 1970s, when I got out of the Marine Corps, my rich dad had me take two things. I had to learn how to sell because sales equals income. And then I had to learn how to invest in real estate because real estate is debt. So most people say, you know, live debt free. I had to learn to use debt as money. And as you guys know, hmm. in 71, Nixon took the dollar off the gold standard and the US dollar became debt. So I do almost everything opposite of what the pundits say. I, I'm not debt free. I use debt as money to acquire real estate and that minimizes my taxes. That's what I do. That was one of the biggest wake up calls of my life. I said, the reason between rich people and poor people is they don't know real money from fake money. And my mom and dad didn't. Good people, but they don't know that. So they spent it. And so today, you know, I have millions and millions and millions in gold and silver. And I also use debt. I don't use money. And guys like Dave Ramsey said, will say live debt free. And for 99% of the people, that's good advice. Mm -hmm. But if you're going to be really rich, you have to learn how to use debt as money. But to do that, you've got to be a lot smarter than some hodler, you know, chasing <laughs> Ethereum and all the other stuff. Okay? So that's what real financial education. I don't have an answer. I don't know what's going to happen in the future. Could my Bitcoin go to zero? Yes. But gold and silver have been here since the earth was formed. It's been gold, it's been money for about 12,000 years. Bitcoin has been money for 10. Now, does that mean I don't buy Bitcoin? No, I still will buy it, but I'll buy it because it's liquid. I can get out of it if I made a mistake. Most people go to school to become employees. It stands for E, employee. Or they become specialists like social media guys. But where a rich dad is different is that this is what you go to school for, become doctors or lawyers or accountants or pizza shop owners. 
But this is the B and the I side. This is big business, and this is a professional investor. Not stocks, not mutual funds, not ETFs, not 401ks, not that stuff. Professional investor. So the problem with most millennials, they went to school and they came out here, right? That's correct, yeah. That's the problem. What Rich Dad does was shift you to think on this side. So the B and the I side, 500 employees or more, professional investor, you want 401ks and stuff, that's on this side. But you have the power with this thing to go over here. So my whole message is this, and these are all from my Rich Dad. This is called the BI triangle, B and I. To be a big business owner and investor, there's eight steps to it. Number one, you have to have a mission statement for your company. Number two, you gotta have a team. Number three, you have to have leadership. And now then you have product. Everybody says, oh, I got a great product. Well, product is the least important thing. Then you have to have legal. You know, you have to patent all those contracts. Systems. You know, a car, an automobile is a system of systems. A computer is a system of systems. The human body is a system of systems. That's why you have, to have a good team. You have the communication. This is the most powerful communication device ever. You know, but most people use it to text and complain. <laughs> yeah, and check their social media accounts. Yeah, and... I mean, grow up, you guys. <laughs> and then here we have cash flow. You know, cash is either flowing in or flowing out. And this is leadership. So Shane is over here on the leadership side. He coordinates all these people with this thing. Is that correct? Absolutely. Yep. So you have the most powerful tool in history. So let me say this before I begin, because we're talking about going to school or education, whatever that is to you. And education is more important than ever before. But the problem I have with school, traditional education, number one today is it's creating young people like you to be greatly in debt, right, with pension. I mean, not pension, but subprime. Student loans. Subprime student loans. Yeah. <clears throat> you got a subprime education. So education is more important than before, but what do they teach you about money? Nothing. Nothing. So my point here is this. So education is important. But the thing I don't like about labeling a child or a student ADD, okay? ADD is another word for extreme boredom. Do you know, why don't they just call it what it is? A child doesn't have ADD. The teacher is boring. <laughs> They're boring, boring, boring people. Why would I listen to them? So I had ADD, but I call it acute boredom. Then they say you have dyslexia. Well, what the heck is that? I had dyslexia because I was sound asleep. I was always drooling. You know, <laughs> I, mean, I couldn't believe how boring the teacher was. Yeah. On top of that, they were teaching me a subject I wasn't interested in. You know, when I had calculus and trigonometry, I kept going, when am I gonna use this stuff, mm -hmm. you know? So anyway, this is my point of view. Education is the only business that blames the customer for the teacher's incompetence. Mm -hmm. Let me say it again. Education is the only business where you're allowed to blame the customer for the teacher's incompetence. You see, in business, I can't do that. Mm -hmm. You know, if my students are failing or my customers are failing, then I'm responsible for it. Mm -hmm. But who, how in the world can these teachers get away with blaming their customers for the teachers and education systems incompetence? And let me say this one more time. Education is more important than before but what the heck are you learning? That you're stupid. I was called stupid so many times. I almost went nuts. I flunked out of high school twice <clears throat> when I was 15 and 17 because I can't write. And today, I've sold more books than most teachers ever will. It's in the millions of books. So who was stupid? You know, that's the whole point here is this. Mm -hmm. Become a professional investor. It's not easy, you gotta study a lot. But this is what I see coming. financial statement, it's the balance sheet. What I'm concerned about for the millennials, okay? So here we have M for millennials. It's a lot of you. But over here we have today, boom, baby boomers, me. And what's gonna happen is that 
it's going to be the flow of people. These guys are, you guys are going to flow over here and you'll be producing the income to pay the taxes and all this. These guys are going to come over here. We're going to be the biggest liabilities you've ever seen. They estimate that, and nobody knows the real number, but the estimations are this bill for all the social programs, the welfare programs, all the social security, retirement plans, and all this is estimated to be $265 trillion. You guys are going to have to pay for that. So when old guys like me move over here and you guys take over the economy here, uh, what's going to happen is, go up, you have to pay taxes to pay for these guys. So that's, that's why when I speak to young people and all this, I, I kind of joke around a lot and things like this. But this is a massive, 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 massive social problem. You know, like if your mother and father had no money, what would you have to do? You have to pay for them, right? Yeah. Can you afford their health care right now? Mm, I don't think so. You know, like I, I cut my finger here two years ago. The bill was $34,000 for one stitch. $34,000. That's where this comes. That's the, they're estimating. They don't know how much this is going to be total, all the national debt and all this. And as we're talking, you know, they can't balance, they, they, they need to extend the budget to pay for our bills and all this. And it's only going to get worse. So when I speak to your generation, our generation had it really easy. We're going to cruise over here. You guys have had it pretty hard, and it's going to get worse, is my opinion. So that's why the idea of go to school, get a job, work hard, save money, get out of debt, put in a 401k, that was my generation. It didn't work for us, but you guys are going to try the same thing. If you want to be an entrepreneur, you've got to study with Chris Voss. I mean, the number one skill of an entrepreneur is communication. You can call it negotiation, you can call it sales, you can call it whatever you want. But as my friend Blair Singer says to me all the time, he says, sales equals income. Do you know? And if you, when I find somebody who can't sell, it's their income is low or vice versa. But more than that, um, I was, I've been, and I came up, we interviewed Chris years ago when his first book came out, uh, Never Split the Difference. And uh, I, didn't, I hate to say I didn't read the book, but I will read the book now. I'll admit that. And all I remembered from that, which a lot of people remember from Chris, was the, the midnight DJ, you know, voice and all that. So was, I was practicing that. <laughs> didn't work. <laughs> but what really worked, Chris, I'm just going to surprise Kim on this because, you know, about three or four years ago, Kim says, I'm out of here. I don't want to be married to you anymore. And I went, ¿Qué pasa? What did I do wrong? You know, what did I do wrong? Then I was listening to you discuss my friend Donald, the Trump, and he's a really good friend of ours. But what you said about him, it just hit me right between the eyes. I was going, holy mackerel, Donald plays win-lose. You know, he has to win. He wins at all costs. And I was going, oh, my God. And then what, you didn't, this is not your words, but I paraphrase this thing, but if you play win-lose, pretty soon people stop playing. And yeah, then the, that's, that's exactly it. Yeah, and that's my way of saying with, with Kim, you know, we, we're talking before the show came on, I went to military school. I mean, day one, we're screamed at. There is no compassion. Then I joined the Marine Corps, and I learned to adapt to that behavior. Do you know that you talk to everybody like a Marine? So for 35 years, I talked to Kim like a Marine. And one day she said, I've had enough. So when, you, when, you, when, I, re when I, I was listening to one of your podcasts, I went, oh my God. So I want to thank you because what your technology is more than sales, is more than negotiations. You have the key to world peace. If we could learn to speak with kindness and humanity and support. One of the biggest mistakes, I still hear it today from young people, oh, I don't have to worry because I'm still young. Yeah, and that is death to most people because eventually you get old and then you're not young again. So it's a way of saying, when I talk about assets and liabilities, 
One of the most important things you have in your life is time. It's one of your greatest assets or it's your liability. And being, you know, I just turned 70, and I have friends who have nothing. I mean, they have zero. Now, they made, they've made a lot of money, but they have nothing here. They have nice houses, nice cars, 16 wives, 19 kids, I don't know what they have, but you know what I mean? And, and being young is great, except it can be a liability to you. Because when you're young, you're just having a lot of fun and life's exciting, you know, it's new. So, as a time, but the thing is, this is the lesson today, is so many people spend their time focusing here. They want to make a lot of money. And I can hear it in their words. They say, oh, I want a career. This is career. Okay, or I'm going to start my own business and this is the chart here, which we've seen. This is the cash flow quadrant, book number two. E is employee, S is small business, self-employed or a specialist, like a doctor, a lawyer, a web, web designer. B is big business, 500 employees or more, and I is professional investor. So. When I was your age, I knew I wanted to get here. This takes time. This is the hardest, you know. This is where the big mega bucks are, and Kim and I are here, and the money is massive, but it takes time to get there. The big mistake I see young people make is they focus here, and the words are, I wanna do what I love. That's the track. You see, in real life, sometimes you have to do what you hate. Like, people think I like to write books. I hate writing books. But it fills my purpose in life. It's not my passion, my purpose in life. Because my purpose was to get here. A lot of these guys get trapped here doing what they love. And as we've talked about on earlier episodes of this thing, these guys pay the highest taxes. 40% here, 60% in taxes here. 20% here, and then 0% here. So when I was in my, before my 20s, I knew I wanted to go there, and it wasn't doing what I loved. I had to learn what I didn't want to learn. I had sometimes to do what I hated. I had to learn about taxes. I had to learn about debt. I had to take classes. I had to learn about insurance. So I was doing a lot of things I hated doing so I could come over here. These guys never do this, because they, well, they live their passion. I want my passion. The difference in passion is greedy, purpose is for other people. So my purpose was to come over here so I could serve more people, okay? So I have employees here and all this. I don't buy stocks, bonds, mutual funds, because as a professional investor, I can create my own assets. There's three kinds of money today that you guys gotta be aware of. One is God's money, and God's money is gold and silver. So this is silver, yeah. and this is gold. The reason I brought it is most people don't know what it looks like. Mm -hmm. And then there's government money, which is fiat currency, which is the dollar, the yen, the peso, the euro, the yuan. Yeah. Fake, and everybody's working hard for it. It's like eating fake food or mm -hmm. drinking fake water. That's why people are getting sick financially, because they're working for fake money. Yeah. Okay. And um, then there's fake assets, which was another part of the fake millennial, mm -hmm. the fake generation series. But the reason I brought this here is, most people haven't seen it. This here is real silver, plata, mm -hmm. okay? That's what it looks like. And so in 1972, and this here is gold. Yeah. This is God's money. This is what God's money looks like. Yeah. The reason I call it God's money is you can't fake it. You know, you can fake it with a fake ETF, like a gold ETF or mm -hmm. a silver, which I don't touch because it smells as bad as the guys that printed that crap. <laughs> yeah. You know what I mean? <laughs> Jesus. But this is real money. So you look at this here. Mm -hmm. When I first started buying that, that was a dollar forty. Yeah. Today, that's sixteen dollars. And this here is auto, gold. 
And the reason we brought it in is most people haven't seen or touched. This is mm -hmm. real. This is God's money. Yeah. Why did I say it's God's money? Because it was here when the earth was created. Yeah. And it'll be here when we're all dead and gone. Mm -hmm. When you're saving those fake dollars, this will still be here. Yeah. Or those fake ETFs or those fake stocks. A lot of your generation are saying tax the rich. As they say, never happened, Joe. Because the tax laws need the rich to do what the government wants done, their incentives. I provide housing, jobs, and uh, food, and energy. Mm -hmm. So that's what they should be teaching, but our schools will never teach that because they're fake teachers. Anything else? So that's, that's kind of a review of Rich Dad, Poor Dad. Yeah, I think God you gave that. I mean, even when you, when you were talking about jobs, it's like, well, yeah, I, none of us would be here if it wasn't for you creating this company. Yeah. And so um, it's kind of curious as to why the government wouldn't want us to be creating more houses, more, more companies. Why aren't they making us learn this in school? Well, because it's fake education. Mm -hmm. It's fake teachers. It's been going on for hundreds of years. And uh, like I said, what the rich took over, there was Rockefellers, Carnegie, Mellon, and they said, let's, you know, said, we don't need more entrepreneurs, we need more employees. So the purpose of American education is to create soldiers and employees, people who just do as they're told, but know nothing about money. Marketing and sales are a brilliant thing, and it's a it's a global discipline, right? No matter if you're doing business, uh, no matter where you're doing business, it's a global discipline. You just got to be committed to it, and you can't give up on it. But you have to spend your dollars wisely, and that's uh, that's most important. And what uh, what uh, Vic is selling, most small business people cut back. They stop spending when they should be spending on marketing and advertising because sales equals income. But they, they get scared. What, they yeah, get scared. scared. So we'll, 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 let's leave that as tip number one. And if, if you're not an entrepreneur, just know that bad times are the best times sometimes to start a business. I've only started in bad times because everything else is kind of shut down and lots of opportunity when things are slow. But what happens is like many small business people, they cut back on the spending on marketing and advertising or they, they market and advertise to the wrong customer. If you're just starting out and you're right here, you may not have much money, may not have a job and all this, but that's really not an excuse because you can still start. And I would suggest you know, getting Kenny's ABCs of real estate, look at programs, because uh, we're gonna go into, let's start out how I started. It was, uh, the reason I got into real estate was that my rich dad, this is back in the 70s, he knew that President Nixon had taken the dollar off of the gold standard and the prices were starting to rise. And so Rich Dad said one thing, he says, don't save money, learn how to use debt. And so it's counterintuitive to what most people think, because most financial advisors say save money and get out of debt. And we're saying don't save money, get into debt. So it's a different process, you know, so that's really it. The reason I invest with Kenny is because we're into debt. debt. You see, the beauty of real estate over stocks there is there's margins of things like that with stocks, but with real estate, banks are really anxious to lend you money, if you're good. If you're not good, they don't lend you money. So again, it goes back to when somebody says, I don't have money, it's because you don't have financial, you don't have education. You know, stuff like this and this and this. You go, well, I don't have money, so I don't start. Well, you're not supposed to use your own money anyway. And that's what the, that was my rich dad's lesson to me back in the <coughs> 70s. He says, look, the dollar is no longer backed by gold. The dollar is now backed by debt, U.S. Treasuries. And he says, if you're going to be rich, you'd better understand how to use debt. And meanwhile, the other people, all the financial people, oh, save, 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 and put your money in the mutual funds. The postmodernist communists, the Marxists in our academic system, they speak in these platitudes like equality, this, that, you know, and it's as, it's as nonspecific as possible. But as a capitalist, I must speak in facts, figures, and the, the history. But they want to change history, you know, the 1619 project or whatever that is. And the real fact is, you know, America, and then, well, you got to pay taxes. Well, Marx said uh, graduated income tax is essential for the spread of communism. And so my father, poor dad, he believed in paying taxes. My rich dad didn't. Again, the word is taxes. Mm -hmm. And so when you look at what Biden's doing right now, he just, he just put in 87,000 IRS agents who are armed. The reason is they're going after you, small business. 
They're going after the small entrepreneur. They can't touch me, you know, because I'm not that stupid to pay taxes. And I can do it legally. But that's why I give, make fun of my friends Peter Schiff and Mark Moss. You know, they were living in Puerto Rico. I said, if you were a real estate guy, <clears throat> you wouldn't live in Puerto Rico. You could live anywhere you want and not pay taxes, you know. I invest with Kenny McElroy in real estate. So let's say he buys a building for a million to keep the numbers simple. He increases the rent so that he refinances the building at $2 million. So we have a million in debt. He borrows out another million. We now have $2 million in debt. And I get the, he and I get the million dollars extra. How much in tax do we pay for that extra million? Zero. Zero. And who pays the debt? The tenants. The tenants. Rich Dad's World teaches capitalism. So I'll read you something because this comes from this book here, The Capitalist Manifesto. Because years ago, 1965, I read this book here, The Communist Manifesto by Marx. And Marx was just like my poor dad an academic. And the trouble with academics is they're poor. They have no idea how capitalism works. So stay tuned to this program to find out how capitalism works. So once you understood this, I understood my rich dad, why he did things the way he did. And my poor dad hated my rich dad. My rich dad's my best friend's father. And rich dad had all these houses and he paid no taxes and he owned hotels. He was playing Monopoly and Rich Dad paid no taxes. And my poor dad being a communist, but didn't know it, he hated the rich. And that's what Marx did. Marx hated the rich. But I want to read you a quote from Marx. So all of you who believe that paying taxes is patriotic. This comes from this book here, The Capitalist Manifesto. And this book here, The Communist Manifesto, it says here, a heavy or progressive or graduated income tax is necessary for the proper development of communism. I may read it again to you. This is Marx's words. If you want to verify, just read this book here, okay? It says, A heavy or progressive or graduated income tax is necessary for the proper development of communism. And that's what's happening in America. So if you want to be a communist, you stay on this side here. You want to be a capitalist, you come to this side here. And again, Rich Dad's World offers you opportunities to understand this side, not this side here. So anyway, that's why I... That's why Tom is one of my go-to guys, because the less tax I pay, the more capitalistic I become, the freer I become. What are things that you're thinking about? Because with every downside, there's an upside. Someone's get. It's like the way I think about it, it's a zero-sum economy. Money never leaves the ecosystem. It just moves and changes hands. So where's the power going? Where's the money going? This here is a 1964 silver dollar. It's real silver. What happened in 1964, I think it was Johnson, one of those guys, he, he took the silver out of this coin. So this silver dollar today is worth $10. And I tell the story of going into Safeway at the salad bar, and these women were asking me the same question, what should I invest in? And I said, well, give me $10 for this. They go, it's a half dollar. Why would I give you $10 for this? I said, because this could be the best investment of all. I've been collecting silver since I was 17 years old. I own silver mines and I own gold mines. So when the dollar goes down, gold and silver go up. This here is book number two in the Rich Dad series. It's called the Cash Flow Quadrant. So E stands for employee. So you go to school, they tell you go to school, get a job. But if you're really smart like Tom, you become, S stands for super smart. You become accountants, attorneys, and doctors. So Tom, who pays the most taxes of these characters here? Oh, that, definitely the S, definitely the super smart. The, 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 the more degrees you have, the more tax you pay. <laughs> I, it's, thank God, he, most of your friends, Tom, are like me, C students. <laughs> we, we didn't qualify for this one here. 
Uh, that's for sure. You educate all of us. Well, that as a general rule, and this is worldwide too. This is not just U.S. Right. And so Tom and I have traveled the world and employees pay about 40% in taxes. That's right. Anything say about that? And that's worldwide. That, that is. That's a, that's a pretty standard rate worldwide. It's going to be anywhere from 30 to 50%, but on average, 40%. If you make any kind of decent wage, you're going to be up in that 40% range. Correct. And if you're a doctor, lawyer, self-employed, or like somebody says, I'm going to quit my job and start my own business, you become a small business owner or a specialist. I'm going to be a web designer. How much of these guys pay in taxes here? Well, they, they can get all the way up to 60% in tax because they're paying not just the employee's share, they're impl- paying the employer's share as well. So they pay two taxes, employer and employee. So that's what happens when people quit their job and start their own business without talking to Tom first. Okay, so big B stands for big business, which is according to the tax code, 500 employees. But B also stands for brand. Right. And most people don't build a brand here. So big business, like the big corporations, how much do they pay? Uh, typically around 20%. 20%. And again, what Tom instructs people, advises people, it's because we're doing what the government wants done. So why would the government give a tax break to big business? Well, because that's where the jobs are, right? So one of the government's primary goals is to create jobs and employment. And so the big business doesn't pay the taxes. In the B quadrant, it's the E people who work for the big business who pay the taxes. Right. The government needs people to hire these people here. Correct. And so if you hire a lot of people, they'll give you a tax break for that. And then I stands for investor, but it's an inside investor. In other words, over here, lots of people invest, but they invest in a 401k or an IRA. They invest in public market, like stocks, bonds, mutual funds, ETFs, which I don't, I don't have any of those things. I don't want them. But over here is an insider or investor. How much do they pay? Well, they, they, they're the ones who get down to zero and pay zero tax. So if you enjoy being over here, you can tune out right now. Interesting thing is these guys here can do this. They can. If they have a good attorney also, right? Right. So that's why I have Garrett Sutton and he's he's our attorney. But you have to act like these people. You can't act like these people. What do you want young people, young civilians today to understand? Maybe a lesson or uh, or or or. Um or an experience you've had serving our country from the Marine Corps that you wish young people could learn today? Well, like I said, I studied this book, Communist Manifesto. I read that at 19. I went to the Academy, Merch Marine Academy. And it's also, I pointed to a Naval Academy, but I took Merch Marine Academy. But the most important thing is this, when I was flying this aircraft, we went down three times, crashed. We didn't get shot down. The aircraft was so tired, you know, you just kept falling out of the sky. But the thing that works, we had the best team. You know, as soon as my engine quit, I was about 1,500 feet flying into North Vietnam, not north, but just south of the DM, demilitarized zone. My engine quit. Immediately, what pilots do is they raise the nose generally. What they train us to do is dive the nose. And so the moment I did that, I, I heard my crew members, they were jettisoning all the cans of ammunition, dropping the meat, machine guns and dropping the rocket pods. And we're, we were in the water within like 10 seconds. But it was the most powerful team, young guys too, two pilots, one crew chief, and two young Marine gunners. We we're a f- team. So what's going to get you through? Probably the next 10 years is how tight your friends are, how tight your team is. You know, so that's why I count you as one of my assets, because you you allow me to speak. And as you know, our freedom of speech is being taken away, as this guy demanded. So it's going to depend upon who your friends are, you know, are they smart, are they stupid, and things like this. So when things happen. You know, you got to have a team. My team at Rich Dad is ungodly. 
they are such a high performance team. Small, we only 10 people, but we kick ass wherever we go. And thanks a lot to my wife. My wife did a great job. You know, I wouldn't be here without Kim. And we're a, we're a tight team. Kim and I get divorced, unfortunately. But your team right now is crucial. So the final words, as Maureen said to each other, Semper Fi. Semper Fi means forever faithful. The older I get, I go, the more I don't know. And uh, crypto is taking over the world. And um, I was just on my phone to my gold and silver dealer. And I still own gold and silver. And I bought a lot of crypto. But it's a very important subject that we need to be aware of. And once again, the Rich Dad, we don't recommend anything, but we just do our best to give you the information so you can make your own decisions. And I still own uh, some, quite a bit of Bitcoin and Ethereum. But uh, I'm waiting for the price to come down before I buy more, take another position in both Bitcoin and um, Ethereum. I just want people to know that, to know and think, because I get promoted all the effing time you got to get in on this one. Oh, you got to get in on that one. This one's going to go to the moon. You know, I'm an old man. I've heard this bullshit so many, so many times over all these years in real estate, stocks, you know, and, and that's why we have the Rich Dad Radio Show. It's not to promote anything, but the idea of understanding what's good and what's bad about something. How do we generate cash flow, passive income, which is one of the tenets you preached in Rich Dad, Poor Dad, in today's high inflationary environment? Well, I'm still a real estate guy, but I'm not, I've, never been a, I've never been a flipper. You know, guys were buying a house for 10000 and selling it for 20000 I don't do that stuff. I buy income-producing real estate. Like if you owned farmland and it's producing, let's say, alfalfa, that's an asset. I own cattle. I own, I own a Wagyu cattle because... What I sell is the Wagyu bulls semen. You know, those cash flow, I should change that to semen flow. <laughs> 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 and what that's hanging behind me is, you know, George Gammon. He always talks about the economy is hanging on this hot air balloon. And that little basket down there is us, you know, just dangling from this balloon. And that balloon happened in, um, <clears throat> as most people know, in 2008, when Bernanke, who was awarded the Nobel Prize, can you imagine that, printed trillions of dollars to blow the economy into a bubble. And it was the everything bubble. You know, stocks and bonds went up, real estate went up, and he kept dropping interest rates, so the, so the dollar became more valuable. But what, what happened this year, David, is that balloon's coming down. It's called what Andy Shepman calls the three times crash. Stocks, bonds, and mutual funds crash, real estate crashes, and cash is trash. It's going to start flowing. The U.S. dollar, I mean, is going to start flowing back to the U.S. because treasuries are going down. If you don't have gold, and I mean physical gold or physical silver, you better start doing it now because our the U.S. dollar, although Jay is Canadian, he, he can see sometimes clearer than Americans can, how screwed up our dollar is. Yesterday, I panicked. Gold pushed 2,000 US. I don't know what it is in Canadian, in the loony. <clears throat> but um, I think next stop is 5,000 for gold. Okay. And it may take another five years, but I think, it, uh, you know, this, this here is a real gold coin. And mm -hmm. my first, the first one I ever bought was in 1972. I bought it in Hong Kong and I paid $50 for this. And today it's $2,000 plus, 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 plus. Mm -hmm. And this also is a silver coin. This is real silver. I don't like fake money. And that's why this Vancouver Resource Investment Conference is important. Because you come to hear about why, if you don't have gold, I mean, physical gold and silver, you should have some now. And today we have <laughs> both good news and bad news. And the bad news is the world economy is collapsing. But the good news is the number one investment that everybody in the world can afford is silver. Everybody. And 
That's the good news. But will most people buy it? No, they'll save money instead. And they'll save money in, in spite of the fact that they're printing trillions of it. Gresham's law is in full force right now. Bad money is pumping into this system. And all these idiots, you know, it's called financial stupidity. They're saving dollars. You got to be kidding yeah. me. And they're printing, they're printing so much money. And the beauty of silver, let me say it again. Everybody in the world can afford 20 bucks or you can afford a dime. You know what I mean? You can go to a coin store yeah. and say, I'd like a, a 1963 dime. You might pay a buck for it. But that's how stupid people are. They don't realize that silver has not only been an industrial metal, but it's also a monetary metal. It's been used as you know, payments for years and years and years. So I got this job at Xerox, the same story you have. Is I got my little handy dandy sales planner up. I'm dying. You know, let's say there's 20 sales guys at the Xerox branch at Honolulu. I'm dying. I mean, I'm like, and the, this guy Sanchez flies in from Western region, Santa Ana. He looks at my, my uh, sales thing and I got all these appointments, but no sales. You know, and I'm, I'm going to get fired. So I, I said, I can't, I'm working hard, but I'm going to get fired, you know, because I had no sales. So I go, I, my rich dad's office was at Waikiki. So I go to rich dad's office and I show him my planner. He looks at it. He goes, okay. He says, let me ask you this. How many, and you know, you get, I had to knock on doors. I had no established accounts. The, the FNG is you know, the FNU guy has to always cold call. You know, that, that's as brutal as it comes. So I'm cold calling, cold calling, cold calling on Honolulu. I'm getting nowhere, but I'm making a lot of cold calls. So I show my rich dad, my sales planner, just like you, you, you do with your guys. And I said, my rich dad says, well, it's obviously why you're failing. I said, why is that? He says, you're not failing enough. He says, if you want to get become successful, you have to step up your failure rate. I went, what? Because in my poor dad's family, the academics family, PhDs and all this, failure means you're not successful. And to my rich dad, failure meant you were getting successful. So his advice to me, and I'm still working for Xerox, I'm probably 28 years old. He goes, you got to step up your failure rate. Find a way to fail faster. So that's when you get creative. You know, I can only make so many sales calls a day. What is the biggest difference between fear today versus fear 50 years ago versus fear 100 years ago versus fear 20 years ago? Isn't this a common thing? Like when market does well, economy does well, a few people are prepared for it. Most people kind of sit around, don't do anything about it. What's changed? And is that going to be happening 50 years from now, 100 years from now, where people capitalize and most don't? Well, that's a fabulous question because, you know, today when I refer to 2008, most people remember 2008. Do you know what I mean? That's when mm -hmm. Lehman went down, Bear Stearns went 38 down. 38% percent drop. Yeah, they, they all remember it. But I want to say what you did was really, really smart because the best time to start a business is right after a crash. I made more money after 2008 than I ever did my whole entire life because everybody was hiding like little cockroaches. You, wow, you made more money after 2008 yeah. than your entire life. Yeah, so when, you know, here I'm talking about the coming depression, everybody says, oh, you're, you're such a pessimist, you know? I go, no, I'm excited. You know, I get sexually stimulated thinking about all the, <laughs> all the, all the bargains that are gonna be on the street, you know what I mean? I mean, it's gonna be bargains everywhere. But everybody else, oh, you're pessimistic. No, I'm actually optimistic. Mm. So anyway, so you're very smart to, you know, when I study, I study business. Guys who start right after a crash do very well most of the time. If you have money, you have more power. If you have attractiveness and sex appeal and all that, you have more power. So I think one of the most misunderstood words here is power. And that's why we have Rollo on this program. It's about power. So, and whether you, and I don't know if you want it or you don't want it, but I would say most people want more money. People want to be more attractive, to be more, you know, sexually attractive or have great relationships and things like this. But also you want more power, the ability to do, because many people today are trapped. You know, and when people lack power, their lives are kind of different. 
So power is simply the ability to do, and one of the biggest abilities is can you change an addiction into a good habit? Can you take a bad habit into a good habit? So for example, ever since meeting Rollo and the, go and the gang, I was able to break my habit of overeating. I overeat every time I'm under stress. You know, when I, what do I need to do? I need to eat. And thanks to Dr. Nicole Shrednicki, an ultra healthy human, I, and you know, the Carson, the Rich, and Rollo, I've been able to get my body back down to Marine Corps weight, and I'm 74. Mm -hmm. So I have the body of a 25 year old now when I was in the Marine Corps. But I had to get over the addiction of eating. That was tough. You know, thank God I didn't drink that much or smoke. But though, that's power. So did you ever wonder how the rich don't pay taxes? Of course. I mean, it went viral when Trump said he's paid zero in taxes. And so it got me wondering, too. It's like, well, one, how can I do that? Right. <laughs> because I need that. I mean, it would be great if I could pay zero in taxes. And two, how exactly can they structure it to get zero in taxes? It goes over here to um, fake money, fake teachers, fake assets. It's all the same. And all of these guys who are screaming for the rich not to pay taxes, I cover it in fake. I actually have an article from the New York Times where they interviewed Jared Kushner, who is Trump's son-in-law, you know, was, was Ivanka's husband. Yeah. They're, 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 they're richer than the Trumps. Jared Kushner's family is richer than the Trumps. But the, re the reason Jared explains it, why these guys pay no tax, is because they're in real estate. Mm -hmm. They're not in stocks, bonds, mutual funds, and ETFs. And so he explains it. So the reason the rich don't pay taxes is because there's three types of income. They'll never teach you this in school. The fake teachers will never. Number one type of, there's three types of income. Okay, number one type of income is earned income. That's earned income. It's when you work for money, it's earned. Mm -hmm. So that earned income shows up here. So these are the guys that pay tax. So when all the guys are screaming tax are rich, well, you can't tax them because they don't have jobs. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> That's absolutely It's kind right. of funny, isn't it? We're going to tax the rich. Oh, yeah. How? Good luck, you know? <laughs> and then the second type of income portfolio. is portfolio income. And portfolio income is from flipping houses, or you buy a stock for like $10, you sell it for $20. That's portfolio income. Okay. Okay? I don't do that. Trump doesn't do that. So most guys who are flipping houses and all that, buying stocks and flipping to, for, to you're getting this type of income. So this, this income is about 20% today. Some of that here. But the income that the rich work for is called passive, passive income. Passive income is also known as cash flow. That's the name of our game, cash flow. And that income is income that's flowing from here to here. It bypasses taxes. So I know this doesn't sound fair, and it isn't fair. I don't disagree with you. But what's not fair is our schools, which are part of the problem, will never explain that. And so because it's passive income, is it not taxed because I guess you guys are creating jobs and owning and providing houses. You're getting smarter there. <laughs> it's not illegal because the tax laws are incentives to do what the government wants done. So the reason the Trumps, Kiyosakis, and Kushners pay no taxes is we provide housing. Number two in the B column, we provide jobs, so we pay no taxes. And three, you know, it's a bad word, it's oil. When you drill for oil, you pay no taxes. But if you buy Chevron, you pay taxes, stocks. Uh, if you provide food, you pay no taxes. So if real financial education, which will never be taught in school because they're fake teachers. When I was nine years old, my rich dad taught me how to become rich by playing the game of Monopoly. 
And I didn't understand why I was playing this game of Monopoly. And one day, Rich Dad said to me, he says, there's many ways you can become rich. One of the best ones I found this game, Monopoly. Because games are some of the best teachers in the world. Because all games engage four intelligences. Number one is your mind. Number two are your emotions, you know, fear and anger and sadness. Number three is physical. I mean, how can you learn to walk if you don't fall down? And number four is spiritual intelligence. As Maria Montessori said, what the hand does, the mind remembers. As you know, we learn little to nothing in school, but in fact, you will find out that going to school actually diminishes your ability to get rich. You know, so that goes counter to what everybody tells you. you go to school, get a job, and you'll make money. And that worked probably a thousand years ago. Not working today. You know, it didn't work for me. I mean, I have a college degree, but I learned nothing about money. You know, and what I've learned, I had to learn on my own from my rich dad. So we're going to be talking about school, making mistakes, and we're going to talk to you about cheating. Okay? My favorite. <laughs> yes, subject. Okay, so in school, what do you have to do to cheat? I'd say finding a smart person in class and looking at their paper. You see, when I was in school, the definition, definition of cheating was I asked a smart girl like you. And that's how I got through school. I always sat next to the smartest girl in my class. And the teachers kept throwing me out because they said, you're cheating. But I'd go to my rich dad and he goes, that's not cheating, that's cooperation. And so I have my poor dad who would have said I was cheating and my rich dad said I was cooperating. So there are two different points of view. Now there's this brand new book out, I'm having everybody in the company read it, it's called Big Potential. And it's by Sean Acor. Now he's not a flunky like me. He was 12 years at Harvard as a teacher and all this stuff there and he studied all these students. And he's the one that found out that the age of suicide is going down. Kids are committing suicide at a younger age and depression went from age 28 to 14. And he said the reason is is because how we teach kids. So all you school teachers out there, don't read this book because you're gonna find out you're damaging kids. But worse than all, it's making it harder to get rich. Because what he talks about here in this is in school, they talk to you about the survival of the fittest. The A student. Were you an A student? No. I was not an A student either. I was a C student. And I found out that by cheating, I, I was actually preparing myself to do well in business. The big thing about risk here is this. In school, they compensate for risk by telling you to memorize the right answer. Mm -hmm. So in other words, these kids leave, the young people like you leave school thinking, oh, if I know the right answers, then there's no risk. And it drives old guys like me crazy. Because everybody's talking about millennials. What's wrong with them? Mm -hmm. You know, millennials are the most highly, in many ways, the most highly educated generation in history. They have the cell phone. They didn't get educated in school. They got educated on social media, on the, cell, on the <laughs> yeah. cell phones. They know all the answers, mm -hmm. but they're afraid of doing anything. Yeah. You know, the biggest complaint about my generation is millennials know all the answers, but they can't do anything. Mm -hmm. And the reason they can't do anything is because you might hurt their, somebody's feelings, you might make a mistake. You know, and that just keeps you guys just trapped in this little box here. Yeah. So that's one of the reasons I think millennial money is such an important point here. Because if you're going to come into my world, old guy's world, or the information age, you've really got to understand what is risky and what is not risky. And in my world, <clears throat> if you play it safe, that makes you stupid. Because if you don't take risks, you don't get smarter. Yeah. You know, so you may know the answer, but you can't do anything. Yeah. And one of the best things I had is I went, from mil I went to military school, then I went to flight school. I had such great teachers, you know. All of them could fly. You know, so my flight instructor could fly. What a novel idea. You know, a flight instructor can fly. But when I was in high school, most of my teachers were terrified. Mm -hmm. They're all cowards, you know, job security, 
Don't make mistakes. Just memorize the right answer and you'll be safe. Mm -hmm. And that's why most school teachers aren't rich. Yeah. And they teach that to your generation today. Yeah. And most of them are teaching us things that they don't do on a daily basis. Like we have entrepreneurship classes oh, and they're not entrepreneurs, you know? So it's, it's kind of frightening when you think we're relying on the school system oh. and the fact that they're teaching us. So the way to get through college, right, is practicing all the right answers, taking the exam, putting in all the right answers. Yeah. When in real life, that's the last thing that'll ever happen, right? No. <laughs> like you talk about fake, you know, this is my book, Fake Here, mm -hmm. Fake Money, Fake Teachers, Fake Assets. The reason it's fake money, fake teachers, and fake assets is because it all has to be fake. You have to have fake teachers to understand fake money. Then you have to have fake assets to buy those stocks, bonds, and mutual funds, fake mm -hmm. assets. But without fake teachers, fake money, you can't do it. So that's why I love, I love working with on these programs here. Mm -hmm. Because if you're going to be successful, you've got to take some risk. Yeah. And when you, make, you take a risk, you make a mistake, and you might learn something, because we're supposed to learn from our mistakes. Look at Tiger Woods, the greatest golfer in the world, and one of the greatest athletes. He's made a lot of mistakes. You know, he would not be a great golfer sitting in a room listening to a teacher who never played golf tell Tiger how to be a golfer. And so, but, but Tiger, remember, don't take any risk. Don't pick up that putter. Don't pick up that driver. Don't hit something because you might go out of bounds. So don't take any risks. And that's why your generation is more screwed than my generation. <laughs> you yeah. know what I mean? And in, in class, we look up to the person that knows all the right answers. Uh. Uh, like... So really, it's, it's just this, this mentality of having to be perfect and this, have this perfect intelligence. And know all the right and answers. And know all the right answers when that's the person that'll probably be the least successful in yeah. life because they're not willing to make these mistakes. So let me say this again. Education is more important than before, but you gotta be careful what you're learning. That's why I wrote the book, Fake Money, Fake Teachers, and Fake Assets. Don't listen to fake teachers. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I have a friend he teaches entrepreneurship at UC Santa Barbara. <laughs> and I call him up and I say, how in the world can you teach entrepreneurship? He says, well, I have a master's degree. I said, I ask the question again. What gives you the right to teach your entre entrepreneurship? He says, I have a master's degree in entrepreneurship. And I say, hey, Doug, you and I have been friends for a long time. You've never started a business. You're a fake teacher. He goes, but I have all the answers. I said, yeah, but you don't know how to start a business. Mm -hmm. So that's why I do, again, what I do. Education is more important than before, but be careful. There's fake money, fake teachers, yeah. and fake assets. Like some of the biggest fake teachers are those financial planners. They're telling you to, you know, to save money. Why would you save money when the government's printing money? And then they tell you to invest for the long term in the stock market. And you guys know the stock market is ultra short term. There's high frequency trading. Today, long term is a split second. But they're telling you, guys like my generation, to keep your money in the stock market for 40 years and you have nothing left at the end of it. Mm -hmm. Then they tell you to save money. I go, what the heck's wrong with this? I get a little disturbed every time because it happens like five times a day. A young man or young woman come up to me. Oh, I'm getting my real estate license. Oh, I'm buying real estate. I said, at the top of a market? So the reason I highly recommend if you subscribe to only one newsletter, there's lots of them out there, is Bert Doman, D-O-H-M-E-N, Capital Research, his Wellington Report. And again, he has his free book, I mean, it's free advisory, Surviving Soaring Inflation, The Opportunity of a Lifetime. And uh, this is it here, just, you know, you can get it. And The Opportunity of a Lifetime. <clears throat> and I agree 100% with him. <clears throat> you have no idea what it was like, some of you were too young. I'd go into a Chinese restaurant and they had white out on all the menus. <laughs> I like Chinese food. But anyway, so one day rice would be a buck, next day be two bucks. And they had to keep whiting stuff out. You know, I'm going, holy mackerel. And then I put together, when I was flying in Vietnam, why my rich dad, who was Chinese, said, watch out because they took the dollar off the gold standard. They're gonna print money. It's called money supply, not interest rates. That's what, exactly what Bert was just saying right now. So they're gonna try and raise interest rates to slow down the economy and they're gonna, 
exacerbate. We're in a recession already because things are slowing. The, the velocity of money is slowing at high rates of speed. But also, it's going to crash the economy, and we may be going into a depression. Now, oh, you're such a bad news guy. I tell you something. I learned more in the 70s than I do today. Because when, it was, when, we were, when I was trying to put a real estate together when interest rates are 20%, you got really smart. I mean, I had to be creative and all this. I still make it cash flow. So, ladies and gentlemen, it's only how smart, you know, how creative, how smart you are in the future and how resourceful and resilient you are. Because I'm afraid Bert's correct. This is May 2022. I think we're heading into a depression. It's going to be a recession. That's a given. We're already there, technically. But a depression is going to be a whole nother Magilla. And some people be wiped out, exactly as Bert says, the last depression gave us communism. If you're poor right now, it was called look in the mirror. That's mm. what Rick had always said to me. He says, if you're looking in the mirror right now and you see a loser, that's what you are. Mm. You can't make money in this economy. You better change your thinking. You know, the, you know hindsight is twenty twenty, as I said. Yes, yes. I was, if you're looking, you know, you don't have any money, you don't have a job, your boyfriend or girlfriend has left you, and uh, sitting there, he goes, well, how did I get here? How did I get here? There was a, there was a great book called, uh, you know, Gulag Archipelago by Siltzen Nathan. So he gets thrown in this in a um, concentration camp or a gulag in Siberia, and he says, how did I get here? You know how you got there? Because he was a peacetime leader, mm. didn't fight back. So people are being sold the bill. Go to school, get a job, pay taxes, mm -hmm. save money, get out of debt, buy a house. The house is an asset, and invest for the long term in a well-defined portfolio of stocks, bonds, mutual funds, and ETFs. And I do none of that. When you're putting your team together, what are some things you look for as a team? And what does it take to build a stronger bond with your it team? It takes time. Okay. That's all. Yeah. You know, because, you know, people, when it comes to money, people lie, you know. So it takes time to build that trust. Can you trust this guy under fire? That's why I love the Marine Corps, you know. We may not have liked each other, <clears throat> but when we went into battle, we're all Marines. I could trust. So it takes some time to put a team together. Yeah, it and, and a lot of flakes out there, too. So, like, a couple of my partners, we're 40 years together. 40 years together. Yeah. We know each other like brothers. It's the most important thing is trust, confidence, loyalty, integrity, diligence, cover my back. There's three kinds of money today that you guys gotta be aware of. One is God's money, and God's money is gold and silver. So this is silver, yeah. and this is gold. The reason I brought it is most people don't know what it looks like. Mm -hmm. And then there's government money, which is fiat currency, which is the dollar, the yen, the peso, the euro the yuan, yeah. fake, and everybody's working hard for it. It's like eating fake food or mm -hmm. drinking fake water. That's why people are getting sick financially because they're working for fake money, yeah. okay? And um, then there's fake assets, which was another part of the fake millennial, mm -hmm. the fake generation series. But the reason I brought this here is most people haven't seen it. This here is real silver, plata, mm -hmm. okay? That's what it looks like. And so in 1972, and this here is gold. Yeah. This is God's money. This is what God's money looks like. Yeah. The reason I call it God's money is you can't fake it. You know, you can fake it with a fake ETF, like a gold ETF or mm -hmm. a silver, which I don't touch because it smells as bad as the guys that printed that crap. <laughs> yeah. You know what I mean? <laughs> Jesus. But this is real money. so. You look at this here. Mm -hmm. When I first started buying that, that was a dollar forty. Yeah. Today, that's sixteen dollars. Wow. And this here is auto gold. And the reason we brought it in is most people haven't seen or touched. This is mm -hmm. real. This is God's money. Yeah. Why did I say it's God's money? Because it was here when the earth was created. Yeah. And it'll be here when we're all dead and gone. Mm -hmm. When you're saving those fake dollars, this will still be here. Yeah. Or those fake ETFs or those fake stocks. So this here is called the green box. 
these are, there's 500 of these little tubes like this. Wow. 500 coins in here. And this is one, which is worth more. Which one's worth more? The gold. Yeah, this is worth more than all that. Yeah. Now the reason I say this is because for your generation, this could be the biggest opportunity you'll ever see. I'm not making any commissions on this stuff. <laughs> yeah, of course. But if you look at what happened with the fake central bank, see the purpose of the central bank or the Fed or all, you know, the, the Japanese, bank, the Bank of Japan or the, the European Central Bank, they pump out fake money. Mm -hmm. The purpose of central banks like the Fed is to protect the banks, yeah. not you. They're a criminal operation as far as I'm concerned. Mm -hmm. You're gonna find that most of my talks is about the Fed. So I would recommend you guys buy this stuff. Yeah. Don't save money, don't save government money, because they're corrupt as hell as you know. Yeah. Save God's money. The young people like you leave school thinking, oh, if I know the right answers, then there's no risk. And it drives old guys like me crazy. <laughs> Because everybody's talking about millennials. What's wrong with them? Mm -hmm. You know, millennials are the most highly, in many ways, the most highly educated generation in history. They have the cell phone. They didn't get educated in school. They got educated on social media, on the cell, on the <laughs> yeah. cell phones. They know all the answers, mm -hmm. but they're afraid of doing anything. Yeah. You know, the biggest complaint about my generation is millennials know all the answers, but they can't do anything. And the reason they can't do anything is because you might hurt their, somebody's feelings, you might make a mistake. You know, and that just keeps you guys just trapped in this little box here. Yeah. So that's one of the reasons I think millennial money is such an important point here. Because if you're going to come into my world, old guy's world, or the information age, you've really got to understand what is risky and what is not risky. And in my world, <clears throat> if you play it safe, that makes you stupid. Because if you don't take risks, you don't get smarter. Yeah. You know, so you may know the answer, but you can't do anything. Yeah. And one of the best things I had is I went from, I went to military school, then I went to flight school. I had such great teachers, you know. All of them could fly. You know, so my flight instructor could fly. What a novel idea. You know, a flight instructor can fly. But when I was in high school, most of my teachers were terrified. Mm -hmm. They're all cowards, you know. Job security, don't make mistakes. Just memorize the right answer and you'll be safe. Mm -hmm. And that's why most school teachers aren't rich. Yeah. And they teach that to your generation. Most of the young people your age today, you know, a lot of them want to become entrepreneurs. The problem with this, you have to understand tax. You see, this is all over the world, very little difference. These guys pay 40% of their money in taxes. So they make a $1,000, they're gonna spend $400 in taxes. These guys that make $1,000, they're gonna pay 60% in tax. So our schools are teaching entrepreneurship, but they're not teaching them tax, okay? And because they're focusing on income. Over here, it's 20% in tax. Mm -hmm. So they make $1,000, only, only $200 goes to tax, and these guys, 0%. So the reason financial education isn't working in our school systems is they're teaching financial education for these people and these people, but to really become rich, you have to focus on this side here. And that's the difference between a rich dad and the financial and what they're teaching in school right now. I'd rather be on this side. This side is a lot harder, but in the long run, it's more fun for me. Mm -hmm. On this side here, it's, it's harder, but you're paying tax constantly. So these guys here are saying tax to rich. Well, these guys don't pay taxes. And, 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 and as strange as that may seem, and I'm talking about legal, this is all over the world. So that's the big difference here. One last thing, which I think most millennials understand, is you know in Rich Dad, Poor Dad, I wrote about uh, Ray Kroc, founder of McDonald's. And he was teaching at the University of Texas, the MBA program. And Ray asked, the, and most of the MBAs are gonna come out here. So Ray Kroc asked him, he says, what business is McDonald's in? And everybody yelled and said, no, 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 we know, you're in hamburgers. 
And Ray says, no, we're not, I'm not, a, McDonald's is not hamburgers. McDonald's is in the business of real estate mm-hmm. over here. So what, you have McDonald's here and the money McDonald's makes buys the real estate. And that is my formula. This is Rich Dad, I own real estate. Mm-hmm. I don't hang out here. I'm glad you guys are here, right? And we do our best to make sure you're educated and you have your own businesses and things like this here. But really the formula I follow personally is McDonald's. Mm -hmm. We have education company that buys real estate, which means we make a lot of money, pay zero taxes, legally. I just know that uh, like your father, you know, he went to military school and I went to military school. And notice the, the people that have had really tough mental, emotional, physical, and spiritual training, they're tougher. Yeah. So I came, out of the, I came out of the academy, like your dad. He went in the Navy, I went in the Marine Corps. And we come out tougher, you know, internally stronger. Mm-hmm. And I don't know how you guys get that. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? I, I call it spiritual intelligence at yeah. this point. And then, let me draw this picture, I've, you guys have seen it before, but Again, if you look at it this way, this is intelligences, and this is what makes us up. This makes us human beings. We have mental intelligence. Mm-hmm. We have physical intelligence. You know, like Tiger Woods is a yeah. fantastic golfer. <laughs> I suck, you know. <laughs> and then you have emotional intelligence, and emotional intelligence they call it EQ, Mm -hmm. is the most important. Because I get my feelings hurt all the time. I get angry, I I, I hallucinate in my head, Mm -hmm. I I think things that aren't true. But the biggest one of all is the spiritual. And the difference between mental and spiritual, it's very simple. Mental causes two. So, Man, woman, good, bad, up, down. Where spiritual is one. So I'll give you an example. Why do I do my work? Mm -hmm. Yesterday I was driving down the road and I saw this young guy. God, just broke my heart. You know, he's standing there in the hot Phoenix sun. Mm. He's just unemployed, need money to feed the kids and all that. Now, mentally I could say, well, get a job, you idiot. You know, da, da, da. But spiritually... I, I am him, I feel for him. Yeah. So in my work, I work for this. You know, like I don't need the money. Yeah. But I, as my teacher was Dr. R. Buckminster Fuller, and he says, I don't work for me, I work for everyone. And that was one of the biggest lessons I got from the military, you know, from the military was a very high spiritual intelligence. That's why your dad and I get along so well. Because so, yeah. when we went into combat, which is a horrible experience of good and bad people, enemy and friends, you know, but we, when we climbed into our aircraft, there was a crew of five, we became one. It is the best feeling, as horrible as it is, mm-hmm. flying into combat, because we might not come back, but it was the highest feeling of all. It was spiritual. And I'm afraid, it's not just millennials, it's human beings, mm-hmm. you know. Well, you know, is this good? Is this bad? Is this the best Vuitton shirt? Can I get it at a better price? Or oh, he's cute or she's cute, you know what I mean? But is there somebody better, right? Yeah, I mean, that's exactly what's going and, on. Uh, so you guys are stuck in your head, mm-hmm. and I think you should get more into your spirit, you know, like mm-hmm. saying, what can I do for my fellow human being? Yeah. What can I do for the environment? Mm-hmm. And I think the biggest secret of my success is I, I have all, you know, we all had these. We all have some degree of physical things we do. Yeah. Emotionally, I'm a, <laughs> I'm a basket case a lot of the time, mm-hmm. you know. I get upset, I get angry, I get sad, I get my feelings hurt. And I'm always, this is good, this is bad, this is, you know, you watch politics, it's all good and bad, it's a bunch of BS. Yeah. But what keeps me going is this, and it's spiritual. Yeah. is how can I serve others? Oh, yeah. How can I serve the planet? How can I fix this problem? You know, and millennials, it's not just millennials, it's just human beings in general. Yeah. 
if you can get back to being one, being compassionate. Yeah. You know, you'll always have idiots here. You'll always have idiots here and idiots here. Mm -hmm. But just stay in your spirit. Yeah. So like when I saw that guy, he's probably 45 years old. I couldn't imagine being a father saying, I need money for my kids. And, you know, I gave him a few bucks, but it doesn't help. No. I'll always, when I gave him a few bucks, I was just saying, hey, we're one. Yeah. I feel your pain. And so what's happening, I think, it's not just millennials, it's human, human yeah. beings are idiots, you know. Yeah. We inflict a lot of pain, but this is spiritual intelligence is how do we make it one? Mm -hmm. you know, like my love are trees. When I see people cutting down trees, I want to kill them. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I want to kill them. <laughs> you know, but, and then the oceans, you know, it just breaks my heart because yeah. I grew up in the oceans. Oh, yeah. So when we're in our spiritual, in our heart, in our silence of the brain, of the mind, then we're most effective. If you understand how money is created, money is credit and debt. That's all it is. Money, credit, and Money, I mean credit, debt, and taxes. That's what money really is. Mm -hmm. But they don't teach you that in school. So today, the reason the world economy is crashing goes all the way back to 71. But what happened in 71, they could just make fake money and they can keep printing fake money. And this is the US dollar. The US can keep printing fake money for a number of years yet. Mm -hmm. And the only way they could keep the economy expanding, they had to find people stupid enough to get into debt. So as you know, one of the most, uh, uh, I didn't have this as a kid, you know, it's called a credit card. Now everybody has credit cards, but they never teach you how to use it. Yeah. Now, why did they have a credit card? It's because they needed more money. So they keep expanding the economy they keep finding people stupid enough to just get into debt. They give them credit cards and all this and say, well, he gives auto loans. But I think the most dastardly thing for your generation was in 2009 when President Obama uh, went to the banks and said, look, we need to get the students more into debt Be under the guise of you need to get a good education. That's why I keep saying to the young, the millennials, you know, they're a pack of wimps, you know. I meet millennials who are just horrifyingly weak. <laughs> Snowflakes, I call them. You know, yeah. they go to college and doormats. They're taught trigger events or whatever. You know, the, the, I don't know what they say today, but they've got to have special rooms where there's no whatever. I'm going, holy mackerel! <laughs> Welcome to the real world. You know, and there's other millennials who are as tough as nails. I mean, this is the biggest opportunity they've ever had. Huge. So it just depends upon what's between this here and this here, and what's mm -hmm. in the heart. And that's what happens if I have no basic financial education, you know, whether you're old or young, if you're stupid, you're stupid. I mean, just don't worry about it. You know, the market will take care of you. And the difference was, is that in my generation, it was real estate. So I took real estate courses. I've never lost money in real estate. I've made fortunes in it. Do you know? I'm an insider because I do all my, I don't, I don't touch REITs, R-E-I-T's, real estate investment. I don't trust paper. I am, I handle my own. I've started my own gold mine in China. Unfortunately, the Chinese took it. That was a lesson. And I started my own silver mine in Argentina. So I understand mining. So all of these guys, my friends who are in crypto, now tell me they expect about 15,000 new ICOs. So this, you know, basically all it takes is a brain and some electricity and a computer, and you can create your own crypto. So could Bitcoin be toast also? Possibly. You know, so when I told this guy I bought Bitcoin when it dropped from 65 to 50, he says it's going to go to five, $5. I said, it might. The difference is I, I can afford to lose that money. But that's called, I'm speculating. So this is, in my world as a professional investor, I'm in the acquisition phase. I'm taking a position. I've taken a position in Bitcoin and Ethereum. Every time it looks like it's getting a little cheaper, I'll buy it, I'll buy it, I'll buy it. So I, I saw Bitcoin at 20,000, I think it was, and it dropped to seven and I waited, and when it came to nine, I, I bought. So today, let's say it's 50. I'm still in the money. And if it goes to 40, I'm gonna buy more. 
Now, could I be wrong? Absolutely. Could some hodler coin take off? Yeah. You know, could there be another pets.com of crypto? Absolutely. But the difference is I'm in the acquisition. I've taken a position. I took a position in silver and gold. I have millions, not in this country, but I don't have any paper. I don't have any ETFs. I only take the real stuff because as I said, the Perth Mint can't deliver on silver. If a mint can't deliver on silver, who do you trust? And so with all of these young kids coming up going to invent the next Bitcoin, I don't doubt they will. I don't doubt one of those 10,000 new crypto may blow Bitcoin and Ethereum out of the water. And if that happens, I'll make my switch. But until then, I'm like I was with gold and silver. I'm in acquisition, I've taken a position. When I sell, it's called distribution. So as a professional, I, not a speculator, and I don't flip houses because I think that's really stupid because it's such high risk to flip a house. But today, everybody's flipping houses because the price of real estate is going through the roof. You know, I, I was talking to the guy who cuts my hair. He says, oh, I finally bought a house. You know, and I offered 100000 over the price. I'm going, holy moly. There's, it's a mania. There's, you know, there's booms, bust, and mania. Real estate is in a mania because of this. Because the interest rates are so low, so not only are stocks going up, real estate's going up. And everybody's jumping in. When this happens, the idiots jump in. Mm -hmm. And that's what's happening right now. So Bitcoin is the same way. So when it took a dip, I bought more. Can it go lower? Yes, I'll buy more. But there's one big difference between Bitcoin uh, and Ethereum and real estate. Bitcoin and Ethereum are liquid. Means I can get out. If I realize that there's a new NFC, whatever they, what they call them, or a new guy's gonna take out Bitcoin, I can get out. But with real estate, the trouble with real estate, if it goes down, you're the skipper of the Titanic. You're gonna ride that baby all the way down. So real estate is not liquid. At least stocks are liquid. But that poor bus driver dropped from liquid stocks into liquid bonds. He's got no place to go. So when I talk to him about possibly gold, silver, or crypto, no, oh, he's an old guy, you know, he's an old guy. So those are, they're all related. So in, in this world of money, they're all related. You know, it's like we're all related somehow on this whole planet. And so that's the world of money today. So that's real financial education. If you realize you cannot make a prediction, especially today, because nobody knows what's going to happen until it happens. The question is, are you prepared for what it happens? So I love Bitcoin because if I realize there's a hot new, hot new coin coming along, I can get out. But in real estate, I'm stuck in it. So those are some of the differences between investors, acquisition, taking a position, and just distribution. I can distribute my Bitcoin and gold and silver quickly. I cannot distribute my real estate that quickly or my businesses. So those are some of the differences in that real financial education. First word I had to learn at the, at the academy, mission. Mission is spiritual. Mm. What's your mission? And my mission has always been to serve people. Most people, all they give up is making money mm. and screwing people. That's called the Federal Reserve Bank, Wall Street, and all that. I want nothing to do with them. So I just don't play their game. But you have to get smarter not to play their game. The thing I've said before, and I'll say it again because some people need to hear it, your generation, this thing called, uh, well, this, my cell phone, didn't come out until 2007. Yeah. The millennial generation was given the most powerful single tool ever given to any generation. And what are you guys using this thing for? To Twitter, to, you know, social? I don't, I don't know what you guys do with this thing. But I love this thing. I mean, I'm, I'm on YouTube constantly. You know, I find the best teachers in the world out there. I mean, I don't know why anybody would go to college because the best teachers are on YouTube for free. Mm -hmm. And I learned, and, and it's not that the teacher is the best. The thing I love about YouTube is I can get one person says X and the guy that says no, that's Y. 
And so I'll listen to both sides. But that's where your intelligence grows because both sides have a point of view. And I listen to both sides. But if you're in college, you got to listen to one idiot who's boring. You know, and I, I really did not like school, you can tell. Yeah. <laughs> First of all, is I didn't want to become an employee. You know, every time the teacher says, go to school and get a job. And I said, but I don't want a job. You know, and, and it didn't make sense to me because I had a rich dad. My poor dad was an employee. He was a good one. But personally, I didn't want to become an employee. But your generation now must. That's the difference. Yeah. You must. You don't have that option. A lot of people say, well, how come my kid's kicking my butt? Except because they, they don't have brakes put on yet. You know, kids just make mistakes. Parents still have what they were programmed to think. Don't make mistakes. Make sure everything, you know, I mean, they're, they're slower. Kids are faster. And so they learn faster. So I learned, you know, when I was 10, my rich dad started teaching me about entrepreneurship and investing with the game of Monopoly. And, you know, I said, so I'm sitting there, and my poor dad, the academic, is going, what you doing? I said, I played Monopoly. And he says, well, that's a waste of time. You know, go back and study. And so I, he says, well, ask, ask, ask your friend's father, Rich Dad, why are you studying Monopoly? And so I asked Rich Dad, I said, why are we studying Monopoly? He says, because one of the greatest formulas of wealth is found in this game board, idiot. I said, what is it? I'm 10 years old, going like this. Four greenhouses, 1031 tax deferred exchange into a red hotel. <laughs> <laughs> and, guess, and so I'm a kid, boy. And my old man, the PhD from Stanford and all this stuff, you know, and he's broke. He's broke. He's broke. And Rich Dad goes from his little dinky little store, and now the property he owns is called the Hyatt Regency on Waikiki Beach. So he followed the four greenhouses, one red hotel. And again, the greatest educator of our times could have been Maria Montessori, who said, what the hand does, the mind remembers. So my Rich Dad... <laughs> For my education, he says, you want a real education, kid? I go, of course, of course. So he owned, my, my father called, poor dad called him slums. My rich dad said, I'm a low-income housing provider. <laughs> you know, I mean, it's just definitions. He says, go knock on doors and collect rent. I went, what? You know, he said, that's why people, everybody wants to invest in real estate, but they don't want to collect rent or fix the toilet. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? So I'm 10 year old, 10 to 12, I'm, uh, your rent is due. Then I heard more bullshit than I've ever heard in my entire life. <laughs> these, these are grown adults going, hey, kid, beat it. Or, you know, I don't have my way. It's you, it's you sons of a bitch. It's you capitalist. I'm 10 years old. So we can't afford it. And they got big screen TV in the room. They're watching TV. But they can't pay the rent. And they have kids. What are they teaching their kids? knocking on doors, asking grown-ups for overdue rent, fried my brains. So I don't want to be like you. I find the best teachers on YouTube. They're not, you know, the, uh, they, they teach because they want to teach, but some of them are crooks too. Well, you got to know the difference. And so I think YouTube is fantastic, and I'm on YouTube constantly. So you saw me take off my headsets and all this. I go to sleep with YouTube on, but I choose my teachers wisely. So who are some good teachers people can watch? Well, I listen to guys who, who, who hate each other. <laughs> this may sound strange, but Peter Schiff hates Bitcoin. He's a good friend of mine. He's a gold guy. Then I listen to Michael Saylor and all these other guys who are Bitcoin guys. And, and uh, so I just listen to the two points of view. Because in between there is something I can take away. Mm -hmm. But I don't listen to just one side. That's why I said when I was in 9-11 or 9-13, I was in Istanbul talking to Muslims. I said, I want to find out about your religion. Because I was told what I was told as a Marine. Mm -hmm. You know, the Crusades and other infidels and all this crap that we're taught as Marines also. And I said, you guys are good people. They're good people. Today, you have most of these people who have a financial plan and they want you to give them their money. You know, put your money in stocks, bonds, mutual funds, ETF, and savings. Okay, you know. <laughs> and most of that money is gone anyway, as we talked about earlier. In the last two years of most people's lives, all that money disappears anyway. So what's the end game for Kim and I here? And for Kim and I, our end game is the end financial plan is this money goes into what's called 
a CRT, a charitable remainder trust. This charitable remainder trust then means the government can't tax me. That's the reason. And you know, and you gotta study taxes. The only people that pay taxes are these people here because they're not doing what the government wants. Over here, I'm a partner with the government. The reason I get a tax break here is because I provide jobs. These guys don't provide jobs. I get a tax break here because I invest in real estate. Most people have a house. I have thousands of houses and we provide housing. I provide oil, you know, so I'm a, I get the tax breaks because the government's my partner. If you go to school and get a job over here, you will pay this tax. And you should, because you're not doing what the government wants. I do what the government wants. So at the end of our lives here, we're gonna put it here into a CRT. And the goal is, the government can't tax that money. And it goes out, and our, for Kim and I, Our goal is every year we're going to give a hundred million to charity. Every year, most people will be broke at the end of their lives, so we're going to give all this money back, and for into perpetuity, charities that we support. Like I'm, I'm very much into the oceans, so I support Greenpeace. Kim loves animals, so she supports animals. We support all these things that we can't do because we're working our businesses. So we give our money back to charities. We give it to boys and girls clubs and other charities all over the world. A hundred million dollars, for a lot of people, you know, for kind of like Trump, not a lot of money. For us, it's a lot of money. So a hundred million dollars a year is our goal. Today, we're probably, if, if, if I died and Kim died today, it'd probably be 25 million a year. But I have probably another 10 years, 20 years to live so my, <laughs> this is the ultimate goal. Kim has probably another 30 years. So can we make this? Most likely. And if, if we don't make it, we're still at 25 million today. But that's the end game here. We just give it back. And because we give it back, the government doesn't tax us. That's why I love the tax law. The difference is, is when I left my high pay, I, so I got a job with Xerox. So that's the last job I ever had. So when you look at the cash flow quadrant here, E S B I. Here I was. Okay. And I was making a lot of money at Xerox. Yeah. I went to Xerox for one thing, not the money. I worked at Xerox because I had to learn how to sell. Mm -hmm. Because entrepreneurs have to learn how to sell. So I was preparing for this quadrant here. Yeah but I was really preparing for the big business quadrant. Mm -hmm. So I took a job at Xerox for four years, so I was preparing for these two quadrants here. So when I talk to young people like you, like you're here in social media, yeah. you're learning the same thing I was learning at Xerox, mm -hmm. except you're learning technology-wise. Yeah. Very smart. 100%. That's ex and that's exactly right. what I'm doing here. Yeah. And one thing I actually really do appreciate when I worked at the bank, was that we were very sales orientate, orientated, right. and that's all that mattered. And I think that's where I got a lot of my sales skills too. From. Correct. Like Talking it was learning and learning how to get rejected yeah. and finding a way to not get rejected Good. next time. Good. Mm -hmm. So the lesson to young people is: don't take a job for the money. Take a job for what you're learning. Yeah. You know, and the harder and it was really hard because I, I didn't like. I'm I'm actually a very shy person. Mm -hmm. So learning how to sell was the hardest thing I could do. But if I hadn't spent four years learning how to sell, I never made it here, I never made it here. Mm -hmm. So the entire time that you were here, you were preparing to jump to the other quadrant. Correct. Mm -hmm. So every job is not so much for the high paying job with job security. Yeah. For not, not everybody, you know, most people should have job security because mm -hmm. they're not designed to be entrepreneurs. Mm -hmm. But if you're gonna be an entrepreneur, then you better take this job and say, well, which way am I gonna go? Yeah. Okay. So I knew my job at Xerox was to go here and here and here, yeah. not stay here. Mm -hmm. And I actually make so much money over here that I don't need job security, I yeah. need the money. <laughs> so really that's the lesson. When you look at a job, you look at what can I learn mm -hmm. more than how much can I make. Mm -hmm.
And I think that's the biggest challenge. And if you, you look for a job where you can learn a lot, the harder the job, mm -hmm. the better it is. Yeah. Do you know? Yeah. And the sad thing today is there's guys my age, all guys, who should be retired, but they can't afford to retire. So they're going back looking for a job. Last night I was talking to this Vietnamese guy. He, he lost his job with a telecom company. He was a you know, computer programmer. Yeah. Yeah. So the saddest thing, and this guy I meet, nice guy, probably a few years younger than me, he's now working three jobs because in his head, I mean, he was a high paid executive with a telecom company yeah. and he lost his job, the company's out of business. I won't mention his name. Yeah. But he still has go to school, get a job. Mm -hmm. It's still running his head here. Mm -hmm. Rather than say, what can I learn? And today, I mean, it's, it's really sad. I was having coffee yesterday, and this guy comes up to me. He's about my age. He says, can I come to your company and apply for a job? I said, man, mm -hmm. you're as old as I am. Yeah. But he, I said, he says, I just don't want any problems. I just want the paycheck. Well, most successful entrepreneurs have gone bust, right? Yeah. You know, Henry Ford, an old-time entrepreneur, he went bust five times. Okay, look, look at Steve Jobs, yep. his own board fired him. Yep. You know, Bill Gates was taken before the Supreme Court for monopolistic practices. Right. Even my friend Donald Trump went down a billion dollars. Yep. I only went down a million. So the average person is so afraid of those losses, <clears throat> they never get ahead. Because at school they teach you if you make a mistake or if you fail, you're a failure. But that's not real life. A baby learns to walk by standing up and falling down, standing up and falling down. And our school system punishes you for making mistakes. That's why my poor dad, an academic, mm -hmm. was so unsuccessful. He was terrified of making mistakes. So once again, is your generation, mm -hmm. you got more fake to wade through and figure out what's real. So today's millennial money is fake rich people. And from my world, you know, I started with absolutely nothing. And I've run in, in my lifetime, some of the most dangerous people on earth are fake rich people. And in my world, which is money, how do you know if somebody giving advice is real or fake? So let me go back to you, because your generation is also called millennials, the bling generation, right? <laughs> yeah, it's all about what you wear and how you act um, and portraying this life of living our best lives. And so traveling, buying purses of name brands. Well, how about these guys who have $500 sneakers on? Yeah. And, <laughs> and like, you know, I used to work at a bank, so you would see this person come in with this lavish car and this, um, like, their Gucci belt and their Valentino shoes and had probably about 50 bucks in the bank account. <laughs> <laughs> so it's like, either they're knockoffs or you really don't know how to use your money. <laughs> right. So one of the reasons you want, you want to know about fake rich people is I would say 95% of Americans are fake rich. Yeah. They may have you know, a nice big house, the Beamer, or whatever yeah. they got and all this. They might have the fake Rolex or the mm -hmm. fake this on, but um, I mean, how much time does your generation talk about bling, like purses and stuff like that? And I think we're in the generation where we fit perfectly with keeping up with the Jones. And so I think it's more important for a person, for an average millennial, how they look and this life that they appear to be living than how financially healthy they actually are. The problem with many people in my generation is they look rich, but they're fake rich. So the first thing that most guys or men and women buy is the big house. Mm -hmm. So these rock stars, football stars, they buy the big house. That's fake rich. Mm -hmm. Then they drive nice cars. And you know, I, I have my Rolls sitting out here, I have my Ferraris, I love nice cars. And then they have a lot of bling. Yeah. But that's a very, very poor person. Mm -hmm. So the thing is, how does a young person know, especially if you're looking for a spouse or a partner and all this, and in business also? My biggest challenge in business was that I had a lot of business partners who are fake rich. Mm -hmm. 
that nothing. But they live in the big neighborhoods and all this. As one one partner said to me, she says, "You only make a hundred thousand a year." I said, "Yeah." She goes, and I went, "But the hundred thousand came from the asset side." So a hundred thousand came from assets going into my income, and what they had is they had no assets. But her husband had a uh, you know the high-paying job, yeah. and so their cash flow pattern went like this: most went to taxes, and then they supplied this big house and all this, mm, and then they had their kids in private schools. So when you're driving around the neighborhoods looking at so-called rich people, you know, most of them aren't rich. They're actually one paycheck away from disaster. So if you talk to young men or young women, whatever you guys are into is here, is you want to talk about assets. So that's my wife and Kim and I talk about all the time is our assets. Our minds, as I've said this before, and ever, is in the asset column. The average person, the middle class person, their mind's in a liability column. So as a young woman today, I strongly suggest keep your mind in the asset column. Mm -hmm. Because I know what, when I was your age, a lot of it was just handling expenses, right? Mm -hmm. Was to rent, yeah. food, clothing, just survive. Medical bills, yeah, right. everything. And then the, the biggest mistake many young people make is they want a high paying job. And the trouble with a high paying job is most of them wind up here in the liability column. Mm -hmm. But Robert, I mean, you have a Rolls Royce sitting outside in your Ferrari out here too, so what does that mean? Well, I like the nice life too, mm -hmm. okay? But this is the difference in financial IQ, financial intelligence, because I think one of the most stupid things people say to young people, live below your means. Do you want to live below your means? No. Nobody wants to live below. I don't either. Yeah. So don't, that's a poor person, yeah. okay? So this is the difference and why we have the Rich Dad Company and why I wrote the book Fake and Rich Dad Created the Cash Flow Game. It goes to this, okay? So here's my roller. Mm -hmm. And I have, I've had six Ferraris. I love nice cars. Mm -hmm. Again, this is my paddock, you know, and all this stuff. I love, and they're all real. I don't have a fake Rolls Royce out there. Mm -hmm. So the question is, how does somebody have this stuff? So that's what most of the so-called fake financial advisors will live below your means. Yeah. Well, look, sweetheart, I love my Rolls Royce. Mm -hmm. You know, I love my Ferrari. I may be Japanese, but I look better in Ferraris and Toyotas. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So this live below your mean is fake advice. If you really want to have the nice things of life, focus again on assets. Yeah. So the deal I have with my wife, Kim, is I can have any, anything I want, but my asset must pay for mm -hmm. that. So the rule of thumb that Kim and I have as a couple is that if I want a new Rolls Royce, a new Ferrari, new boat, new house, anything, any liability, mm -hmm. I buy the asset first, then it buys the Rolls Royce. Mm -hmm. So what buy, what's buying my Rolls Royce right now is I have apartment houses and golf courses. I just focus here and I can have anything I want here. So for young millennials like you, focus here mm -hmm. or you can focus here. Mm -hmm. If you focus here, you can have anything you want. Mm -hmm. So the reason Games are the best teachers, at least Monopoly was for me, mm -hmm. and our board game Cash Flow. The reason I created Cash Flow is a game will engage me mentally. I'm interested. It gets me emotionally. <laughs> Nobody likes to lose, you know. <laughs> yeah. you know? <laughs> and then physically, I have to do something. I, have, I like the board game better than the electronic game because I have to do the math. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. When you do the math, you're actually getting smarter. And then it's spiritually, it's... You want, I want to make sure you win and I can, I don't have to take you out no. to win cash flow. Mm -mm. Do you know what I mean? I don't, have to, I don't have to make you the loser. Mm -hmm. But that's what schools do. 
They have to have one person smart, one person st stupid, one winner, one loser. So when I'm teaching you either real estate or business and all this, I don't want you to lose. I want you to win. So once again, the games are the better teachers, like the game of Monopoly, simply because it involves you, your physical intelligence. And the more you do your numbers on the cash flow game, the smarter you get. Mm -hmm. Emotionally, because nobody likes to lose. This is really surprising. A lot of people lose because they got too happy. Do you know what I mean? Too like with, excited. Yeah, with, no, what happened? Oh, I'm rich. Mm -hmm. Then I get egotistical and arrogant, you know? I get cocky and I'm smarter, I'm richer, then you lose. Mm -hmm. And you also lose if you've been told, well, I'm stupid and I failed and all this stuff, you also lose. So that's why games are the best teachers because you, you go up and down emotionally as you're playing the game. But spiritually, as we get together to help each other out, yeah. we're one. The reason I say only lazy people use their own money is because it takes much more intelligence to raise capital. And so I've never been able, ever since my rich dad, since a little boy, my rich dad forbade me from ever saying, I can't afford it. He says, figure out how you can afford it. How can you do something? Figure out how you can do something. So over my lifetime, most of the projects I, I've started, I've, I've never had any money. I, I like not having money because it forces me to think I get creative, I have to educate myself, I have to talk to rich guys, hey, how'd you do this, how'd you do that, how'd you do that? And what has happened to me, I mean, I just turned 72, I've never needed money. Because if I need money, I figure out how to raise it. You know, millennials are the most highly, in many ways, the most highly educated generation in history. They have the cell phone, they didn't get educated in school, they got educated on social media, on the, cell, on the <laughs> yeah. cell phones. They know all the answers, mm -hmm. but they're afraid of doing anything. Yeah. You know, the biggest complaint about my generation is millennials know all the answers, but they can't do anything. Mm -hmm. And the reason they can't do anything is because you might hurt their, somebody's feelings, you might make a mistake. You know, and that just keeps you guys just trapped in this little box here. Yeah. So that's one of the reasons I think millennial money is such an important point here, because if you're going to come into my world, old guy's world or the information age, you've really got to understand what is risky and what is not risky. And in my world, <clears throat> if you play it safe, that makes you stupid. Because if you don't take risks, you don't get smarter. Yeah. You know, so you may know the answer, but you can't do anything. Yeah. And one of the best things I had is I went from, mil I went to military school, then I went to flight school. I had such great teachers, you know. All of them could fly, you know, so my flight instructor could fly. What a novel idea. You know, a flight instructor can fly. But when I was in high school, most of my teachers were terrified. Mm -hmm. They're all cowards, you know, job security. Don't make mistakes. Just memorize the right answer and you'll be safe. Mm -hmm. And that's why most school teachers aren't rich. Yeah. And they teach that to your generation today. Yeah. The irony of it, you know, when I, when I left school in the 60s, there were plenty of jobs, but the world has changed, yeah. and our schools haven't. And so they're still making this innate promise of get a job. And I was very fortunate when I graduated in 69, we're the highest paid graduates in the world. My classmates were making about 120 to 150,000 a year. Wow. That's not much money today, mm -hmm. but 1969, that was a lot of money. But naturally, as young guys do, we spent every penny of it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I had my rich dad's lesson, the rich don't work for money, in my head. I said, okay, I'm making all this money. I have a secure job, but what's beyond that? And that's where education comes in. So if I could explain this to you for the, for the rest of the millennial lessons, it's really going to be on this theme here because financial education is about not working for money. Mm -hmm. Like one of the first questions, when I finally realized what my rich dad was saying, I said, well, when do I never need a paycheck again? See, my goal wasn't, you know, go to the moon or, you know, cure cancer. My job was, when <laughs> would I never need a paycheck again? Because as long as you need a paycheck, be it from an employer or like my poor dad, he was so afraid of losing his government pension. Yeah. 
And I'm going, Jesus, what a way to run your life. Your pension? Mm -hmm. So my old man got, kind of got fired. He lost his pension. It was the most frightening thing in the world to him. He had no pension. Then it was Social Security, which is even worse. Yeah. So that's why my goal when I was about your age, a little older, around 25, I said, my goal is to never need a paycheck again from anybody, even the government. I don't want any Medicare, Social Security, or whatever. You know, I was a military pilot. So oh, you got to get the military pilot pension. I said, you do, but I'm not going to. And I, just because of this here, that was the difference. Because I never wanted to work for money to need a paycheck. So the next few lessons in Millennial Money, you'll find out what I do work for. So for right now, just let me go to the um, lesson here. So this comes from Rich Dad, Poor Dad, and this, these are some of the distinctions. It was the advantage I had at age nine, because I knew what I wanted to work for. And this here, in simple terms, is called a financial statement. In school, they teach you to get a FICO score. Mm -hmm. FICO is BS. All it means, how good are you paying your bills? That's all FICO means, okay? Should be the FIDO score. <laughs> good dog. So this is what your banker wants to see. So when I was nine years old, playing Monopoly with my rich dad, this is the lesson that's not included in Monopoly, but rich dad taught me. And fund fundamentally, the problem that most people make, they go to school to get a job, and they work here. So this is the poor middle class and these guys. And we're gonna talk about later, your first line item expense is taxes. You know, just recently, President Trump said he had a tax cut. He didn't have a tax cut for these guys. As you know, the rules are always written for the rich, okay? I didn't make the rules, you can get angry at me, but these are the rules. The rich make the rules, the golden rule. Who, he who has the gold makes the rules. <laughs> yeah. So the tax cut went to people here. Mm -hmm. That's where it goes to, you'll learn more about this later on. But this is what I work for. So what I work for, number one is, I'm an entrepreneur, I want businesses, I have multiple businesses. And I don't work in them, as you know, because you work here, you never see me, do you? No. Because I don't work for a paycheck. Exactly. Next is real estate. And real estate is good for many things which we'll go into, but number one is debt. I use a lot of debt to buy real estate and I pay no taxes. That's the relationship there. The next is paper. And that's savings, stocks, bonds, mutual funds, ETFs, and that stuff. I don't have any of that stuff. I don't save money, I don't have any of that. But this is what most people have, a, go to school, get a job, get a 401k and save money. Mm -hmm. Loser. <laughs> okay. I'm doing that just to upset you guys, because maybe you'll start to think. Because I didn't make the rules, I'm just telling these are the rules. Mm -hmm. These people pay the highest taxes, and they work the hardest. And the last are commodities, four different asset classes. So commodities are, number one is gold, silver, oil, land, water, food. So this is what I work for. When I left school, rather than working for a paycheck and working for money, my education had to go beyond getting a job, which I had a good job. But I now had to start when I left school, about your age, the thing I, have, I focused on first actually was commodities. So back in 1972, I started buying gold. And it was illegal for Americans to own gold. Can you imagine that? Wow. Back in 72. Today you have Bitcoin, it's different, okay? Everything is changing so rapidly today. So I started with gold, but actually the next thing was actually oil because I went to school to be a tanker officer driving ships for Standard Oil. So I understand oil. So I own, my wife and I don't own Standard Oil or Chevron or Exxon. We own oil wells. Again, taxes. Mm -hmm. You get no tax breaks for owning paper oil, huge tax breaks for owning real oil. Yeah. And then I went into real estate. Why? 
because I can use debt to buy real estate. And because I use debt, I pay no taxes. Mm -hmm. And then third, I started my business, my first real, real business. I had many, many businesses as a kid. But my first real business was a nylon and Velcro surfer wallet business. And I went worldwide right away. The trouble is I was an idiot and the business went up and the business came down. What kept me alive was this and this. Okay. So you may say, well, aren't you working for money? But we'll go into that next. I don't want what's called a paycheck. Mm -hmm. I want cash flow from here. So that's what I mean by the rich don't work for money. You want cash flow that pays very little taxes and I can use lots of debt over here. The average person who went to school, their biggest liability they have is student loans, of course. <laughs> yeah, of course, definitely. I mean, it's horrible what they do to you guys today. You have student loans, which is the worst type of debt of all because you cannot declare bankruptcy on it. No. And then you get out and you try and buy a house and you call it an asset when it's really a liability. Why? Because the cash is flowing that way. Your house costs you money every month. You rent a house, it still costs you money. Okay. Then you have to have a nice car. I had one of those. This. So the problem with most young people is they go to school to get that job, then a lot of it has student loan debt, then they try and get married and buy a house, have a car, and then they have credit card debt, but they never have the chance to come over here. If they do any investing in America, it's a 401k, which I wouldn't touch with a 10-foot pole. Now, you should, but I don't, because I don't have to. Because I went to school for here, and people who don't go to school should be here. This is a 401k, IRA, ETFs, and that stuff, paper, savings. I don't touch that stuff, and we'll go into that later on. Yeah. Okay. So when I say rich don't work for money, I never want to be dependent on a paycheck, either from an employer or the government. I want to be a free human being. My teacher was Dr. R. Buckminster Fuller. And he says, I don't work for me, I work for everyone. And that was one of the biggest lessons I got from the military. You know, from the military was a very high spiritual intelligence. That's why your dad and I get along so well. Because so, yeah. when we went into combat, which is a horrible experience of good and bad people, enemy and friends, you know. But we, when we climbed into our aircraft, there was a crew of five. We became one. It is the best feeling, as horrible as it is, mm -hmm. flying into combat, because we might not come back. But it was the highest feeling of all. It was spiritual. And I'm afraid, it's not just millennials, it's human beings, mm -hmm. you know. Well, you know, is this good, is this bad, is this the best? V-tone shirt, Am I, can I get it at a better price? Or oh, he's cute, or she's cute, you know what I mean? But is there somebody better, right? Yeah, I mean, that's exactly what's going on. Know. So you guys are stuck in your head, mm -hmm. and I think you should get more into your spirit, you know, like mm -hmm. saying, what can I do for my fellow human being? Yeah. What can I do for the environment? Mm -hmm. And I think the biggest secret of my success is I, I have all, you know, we all had these. We all have some degree of physical, we, things we do. Yeah. Emotionally, I'm a, <laughs> I'm a basket case a lot of the time, you know. Mm -hmm. I get upset, I get angry, I get sad, I get my feelings hurt. And I'm always, this is good, this is bad, this is, you know, you watch politics, it's all good and bad, it's a bunch of BS. Yeah. But what keeps me going is this, and it's spiritual, yeah. is how can I serve others? How can I serve the planet? In my world, I said, <laughs> I see people, they chase shiny objects. And what a shiny object means is, you know, when you're fishing, you throw a lure out, this little shiny object goes, and the fish comes and, and they jump it. That's what most people do. Bitcoin today is a shiny object. I'm not saying you can't make a lot of money in it, but most people are chasing shiny objects. They want to make money. They're not building an asset here. The, thing, the reason they don't do it here, this is the highest risk. Now, this is what I know. The higher the risk, the more education it takes. For example, if I wanted to learn, and I flew, and if I wanted to just fly my little Cessna 172 around the place, not much risk in that. 
But when I had to go to Vietnam to fly, the risk went up. I had to study harder, become better, work harder at it. The reason most people stay in paper, 401ks, IRAs, and chasing shiny objects like Bitcoin, is because they don't want to take the risk here. They're huge. You've got to study. That's why we have a Rich Dad's education, Rich Dad's coaching. All of you guys are allowed to take courses and all this. If you come here, it takes no intelligence to be here. It takes no intelligence to buy Bitcoin. I mean, I have four, four Bitcoin, no, five Bitcoin. It didn't take, you know, just, I don't have to do anything. Over here, I have to do, I have to know a lot. Over here, I have to know a lot. I have to study. So if you want to chase shiny objects like the stock market and all that, you can make, get rich there. It's really easy to get in here. It's really hard here. Any comments, any questions? Does it make sense? They're yeah. chasing shiny objects. So I do agree with you when you talk about Bitcoin being a shiny object that everybody's chasing, right? And one of my favorite stories that you've told is about your mentor, Frank, when he sent you to Peru so you could learn a valuable lesson about maybe something that wasn't such a shiny object and turned into be, because shiny objects change every day. So I wanted to learn about, I, you know, they have ICOs, mm -hmm. initial coin offerings. I wanted to learn about IPOs, initial public offering. And it's how you take a business and turn it into paper. You turn it into stock. So I went to see my friend Frank, who was hardcore here. I don't know how many companies he started taking public. And I said, Frank, and he didn't know me from Adam. I said, I want to learn to do an IPO. And he goes, yeah, you and everybody else. He says, most guys don't have it. They don't have the guts. They don't have the determination. And they're wimps. I said, I want to learn. He says, how bad? This is up here in Scottsdale, Arizona. I said, badly. He says, okay, this is Wednesday. Be in Lima, Peru on Saturday. I went, on Saturday, and we were shooting the, our video for the cash flow game, you know. He says, how bad do you want it? I said, badly. He says, I'll, you know, you, you meet my president in Lima. Frank never traveled. You meet my president in Lima, and I'll find out how bad you want it. So that was Wednesday. Wednesday night, I was on a plane to Lima, Peru. I had to pay full boat. I had paid my own way. Most employees can't stand that because they don't have any money. I flew into Lima, Peru. I went to look at three gold mines and with, with Frank's president. It was an experience and an education I've never had, I would never have had if I didn't show it up. It cost me probably fifteen to $20,000 just for airfare on that thing. I get back on Tuesday to talk to Frank, and I said, Frank, there's nothing there. He says, I could have told you that. So why'd you send me? I want to find out how badly you want to learn. Since most people don't have it. They want a job, they want job security, they want a paycheck, they want a 401k. And that's why they don't get to come here. That's why they don't get to come over here. Nothing right or wrong, you know. I don't ever want to be here. I knew when I was your age I wanted to come here, but the higher the risk, the higher the returns, but also the higher dedication, education, and study you have to go through. So today, and I'm making millions and millions, I make more in a day than most many people make in a lifetime. But it was worth it. Did I lose? Sometimes, yes, but it was worth it. You go to school here, you take no risk. That's why my poor dad was poor. He didn't like to make mistakes. The differences between what they're teaching in school and what we at Rich Dad teach. So this, this is the very big difference. Like I said, most school teachers are like my poor dad. And this was actually, this was Rich Dad, Poor Dad. What you're seeing here is a financial statement. Mm -hmm. You know, Rich Dad, Poor Dad is a book on accounting, the most boring subject on planet Earth. <laughs> but book number two of Rich Dad was this one here. And this was called the cash flow quadrant, right? You have E, S, B, and I. So, test for you. What does E stand for? Employee. Good. And what do employees always say? That they work for money. But they want job security, exactly. mm -hmm. paycheck, and pension. Yes. Okay. What does S stand for? Self-employed. They're small business owners. Yes. Doctors, lawyers. They work for tips. <laughs> they work for tips. No. So they're self-employed. Mm -hmm. 
And B stands for what? Big business owners. So 500 employees or more. Yeah. And I stands for what? The investor. Investor. It's more than just investor, it's insider. You see, this is like Shark Tank on the TV shows. These guys here, have, I've done this and I've done this. So this was my poor dad, this side. This was rich dad here. So the difference that's what schools are not teaching you is what's the difference between these people and these people. That's the big difference. And that shows up, so when I was about your age, I had to make a decision, did I want to, I was a pilot. You know, my, most of my friends went to fly for the airlines, but I'd be here. Or I could be, a, you know, I could have a little, I could be an Alaska flying fisherman around the place, you know, a, a private, a pilot with a small plane and, you know, flying around the place. <laughs> Or I could own an airlines, or I could invest in airlines. And that, that's the difference mm -hmm. in the mindsets and skill sets. You don't just make crossings. The education is extremely different on this side than on this side here. The reason I wrote fake is because it's about fake money. Yeah. So that was 1971. Mm -hmm. Nixon took the dollar off the gold standard. What else Nixon did in 74, he opened the door to China and today all the jobs left America. Another thing that, pe that Nixon did, he created the 401k, mm. fake pension. So in the 1970s, when I was about your age, that's when the world was changing. So fake money, fake teachers. Did the teachers ever tell us that? No, never. And they still don't. Yeah. You know, the teachers are such a waste of time. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, their education is important, but what are they teaching you? Mm -hmm. So it's fake money, fake teachers, and fake assets. So the reason I wrote Rich Dad, Poor Dad, and I wrote this book, Rich Dad's Prophecy, and fake, they're all saying the same thing, is, you know, whether you went to college or not, this one thing is guaranteed. If we're lucky, we're gonna get old. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. Right? Yeah. And I don't know if you know, but your father tells a story of when he retired from the Navy, mm -hmm. How much was his pension? His pension was probably 50 bucks a month. 50 bucks a month. And he was paying for my parent, my, my grandparents' health care costs. Right. That wasn't even enough for the plate, that, a plate of food that day. Yeah. So for the millennials, you guys, it's even worse mm -hmm. because you probably won't have a pension. Yeah. Do you, are you counting on Social Security? Not at all. And I think many people are. So look, look at this chart here. This is Social Security. It goes bust now. Mm -hmm. It's bust. Medicare is bust. One of the saddest things about America today is not only are we the biggest debtor nation in the world, but when I was your age, only 20% of our budget went to entitlements. Today in America, it's 75%. We have all of these people saying the government should take care of me, which leads to AOC mm -hmm. and uh, Elizabeth Warren and Comrade uh, Sanders, they all want the government to take care of them, just as we're going bust. So that's why we created the Rich Dad Company, because it'll give, your, give somebody like you a chance. Your generation's toast, I hate to say yeah. that. And this is worldwide. Mm -hmm. Pensions are broke all over the world. We, I was just in Romania talking to these young guys who said, everybody stole all the money of our pensions. And that was in Rich Dad, in uh, fake, fake assets. They steal your money through your money and your assets. Yeah. It's a horrible, horrible thing. Yeah, and we grew up with the sense of entitlement because that's what we've been taught as of today. And, and what really frightens me is that people still talk about their pensions and soon are, are the parents, people who have parents who have been depending on this pension are soon going to find out it's not going to be there. And so, I mean, what's going to happen? Why why is it that no one's talking about the fact that it's underfunded by seven trillion dollars? It's actually seventeen trillion. Seventeen trillion. But worldwide, it's seventy-seven trillion. So this pension problem is the biggest problem that faces the world, mm -hmm. and the reason is our school system is complicit. You know, they're in cahoots with the banks. Yeah. So that's why I wrote Rich Dad's Prophecy in two thousand two. It was about a thing called the 401k. Mm -hmm. So again, that started back in 1970, again with Nixon and all this stuff. So when I was your age, there was a thing called the three-legged stool. Yeah. 
And what they said was, for my generation, you would have savings, you would have social security, and you would have a pension, a 401k or something. Guess what? Gone. Your generation doesn't have this even. Okay, that's the challenge. So that's why the Rich Dad Company was formed. Like I said, I wrote this in 2002, and I said the biggest crash was going to come in 2016. Mm -hmm. The reason it didn't come, because I started this book in 1999, I didn't see quantitative easing. I didn't see all this printing money coming. Yeah. So if I was teaching a bunch of high school kids, I said, when you leave school here today, the big question in your mind is, what kind of income do I want for the rest of my life? Well, I wanted passive. Mm -hmm. And the average person, because they have a job, is working for earned income, which is the highest tax. You get tired working for that. So when you look at, again, the Rich Dad financial statement here, income expense, assets, and liabilities, Okay, so earned income is this here. That's earned. Mm -hmm. Okay. When you when you work for and then the problem with that income is tax. Then the if you're working for portfolio income, you're generally working for this. You buy a stock for let's say Apple for ten bucks mm -hmm. and it goes to fifty bucks and you sell it. The trouble with that again is tax. Mm -hmm. But if you're working for passive income, which your mom and dad work for, is this is passive income here. Okay, it's cash flow it's also called. So that's why I have the cash flow board game mm -hmm. pictured here. So all I wanted was passive income. So what I have today is I have about 7,000 rental properties. I have hotels, golf courses, oil, and all this. But again, it goes back to these three types of income, earn, portfolio, and passive. So if I was talking to a bunch of high school kids, or even elementary school kids, it's not that hard. Yeah. But I'm glad you asked the question because I think a lot of, a lot of the young people can think now, say, well, why am I in school? Mm -hmm. I don't know. You know, if you just want to work hard and pay taxes on earned income and flip real estate or flip houses, then you're working for portfolio. Yeah. I don't flip. Yeah. <laughs> That's a very big difference. Mm -hmm. I don't like to buy low and sell high. That's flipping. That's called capital gains. gains. Mm -hmm. I invoke, which is portfolio, I invoke for cash flow, which is passive. Mm -hmm. And I can, turn cap I can turn capital gains into passive. I mean, it's so, it gets crazier and crazier and crazier from there on, but I'm glad you asked well, the question. Kim and I retired, she was 37 and I was 47, 10 mm -hmm. years apart. It took us 10 years. But all we did was get richer after that because we found our formula. Mm -hmm. And our formula wasn't go to school, get a job, work hard, save money, get out of debt, <laughs> and invest in the stock market. That yeah. wasn't our, that's not, nothing wrong with that yeah. formula, it just wasn't our formula. What was your formula? Play Monopoly. Yeah. Four greenhouses, Red Hotel. Mm -hmm. And the McDonald's formula of our, you know, as Ray Kroc said, who founded McDonald's, McDonald's is in the business of real estate and, as, and paying no taxes. Mm -hmm. So that's when, so anyway, when Tom and Kenny and the other advisors come here, their job is going to twist your brain to see it differently. Does that make sense to you? Yeah. It's going to be a whole mind shift of what we've been taught. And... That's very cool. non-traditional ways where sometimes when you think about not paying taxes or using debt, it's like, what are you even talking about? How? Right. right. And that's you've been, dangerous. Because you've been taught to pay taxes and mm -hmm. get out of debt. Right? Brainwashed. Yeah. Right. So what's, what, what, I'm, what I'm glad you're starting on here is you bring in my advisors in. Remember, advisors are my teachers. Mm -hmm. They're not just telling me what to do. They're not experts. We work together. We plan together. Uh, right now, Tom and I are, and Kenny, because Kenny is who I, I, I invest through yeah. using debt, and Tom would advise me on taxes. So that my game I play is not be a good employee and work hard and pay taxes. My game is to be a capitalist, to have my money and investments work hard for me. Mm 
-hmm. so I can make millions and millions of dollars and pay no tax. Now that drives a lot of people crazy, right? And Rich Dad, Poor Dad, I said, savers are losers. And guess what they are? You know, today, it's coming soon. We're gonna have negative interest rates. I don't know how they can do that. But if you deposit $100 in the bank, when I was a kid, I got 15% interest. So I put $100 in the bank, and a year later, I got $115. Today, you put $100 in the bank, and you gotta pay the bank $15. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and, and they're printing it. So the, the, the value of the dollar is going down, but the, the price of keeping the bank keeps going up. They charge you to keep your money in the bank. Tell me, why would you save money? So that's why way back when, 25 years ago, the savers are losers. I also said your house is not an asset. And then 2008, the market crashed. Well, it's gonna crash again because everybody's going into real estate right now. Now the good news is that the people are moving out of the big cities like New York, Chicago, San Francisco, Los Angeles, and they're moving into smaller towns. Well, what that does in the smaller towns, it drives the price of real estate up. So again, it pushes out the lower, you know, if you live in Podunk, you little, little dinky town, you don't make as much money as the guys moving in from Chicago. And, and I was up, I was, you know, I own a piece of property up in Northern Arizona and my friends in real estate there are just laughing. They say, oh, these guys from California come in, you know, a house I bought for a hundred thousand, they're paying me 400,000 for it. So they're all happy. Well, for the Californian, they sold a $4 million house that so I can afford a $400,000 property. So this market is all convoluted, going all over the place and all this. People are excited. Kim just sold her mom's house in Hilton Head, South Carolina. These people came out of New Jersey and there was a bidding war for the house. So there's all kinds of things going on in real estate today, but it, it'll eventually crash simply because the government is making it so expensive to build a house. So one of the reasons my niche market with Kenny McElroy in real estate, we only buy existing property because it costs too much to do. You know, the permits and fees and all that, it costs so much to develop a piece of property. So once again, the millennials get screwed because the price of property gets more expensive, but you get less house. Do you know, I'm going, this is so screwed up. But that's what happens when the government steps in and they kick capitalists out and then the socialists kick in. But anyway, that's why savers are losers today. Be careful for those who are not paying attention. In other words, we're about to go into what's called the wily e. coyote moment. <clears throat> Everybody's running along and says, oh, don't worry, the Fed's got my back. You know, the economy is fine. I love this guy, Biden, you know, and we're America's the greatest, and the economy is safe. I was like, Tch. and when people crash, when this thing crashes, and it's coming soon, it's the people that are not prepared, the people who are not watching this emergency podcast number three, haven't watched number two or number one, are the ones you're going to have to be afraid of. Be very, very afraid of those who are sound asleep at this moment, because when they wake up, they're going to wonder what happened. So I'll just tell you a quick story. I went to flight school, you know, to fly these things in Vietnam, and they wanted to prepare us for the worst. So <clears throat> how did they prepare you for the worst? Well, they make it the worst. So what they did is they take us out into the Gulf of Mexico off of Pensacola Beach. They simulate a parachute crashing into the ocean. So it's freezing weather. <clears throat> I think the temperature was minus three degrees or something. We hang out the back. We drop into the water. We got to unhook. Then we paddle ashore, our little rubber ducks. You know, there's like seven of us in a group. And we go ashore into the swamps of Florida. And our job is to survive. <clears throat> so it's a simulate crashing in Vietnam or the jungles. And then we had to figure out how to survive. So everything is it's like a little Boy Scout camp the first day. Everybody's happy. You know, we're chugging along. This is, this is easy. This is easy. Day two gets a little bit more serious. <clears throat> then day three, we're hungry. And this is what I'm talking about. It took us till day three. 
to turn into animals. We went primal. I I was ready to kill the guy next to me. You know, we just, we lost, we're starving to death. We're hungry. These guys are chasing us with guns, you know, blanks, of course, but we're running. I'm, I, I'm, I'm eating palmetto. I mean, just ripping palms apart, trying to get a little piece of nourishment, starving to death. We finally shot a raccoon and there was seven men, 25 year old men and one little raccoon. And pretty soon we were growling. We were just like a bunch of wolves. And and I the side of me came out of me that terrified me. It's what happens when you go primal after day three. Because you made it this far in a video, I want to celebrate you. Most people start and don't finish. Most people never actually follow through. Most people say they want something, but they don't ever do the work to actually get it. But you are different. You are special. Believe Nation, you made it here all the way to the end, and I love you. So it's a special celebration if you put a hashtag believe down in the comments below on this video, I will showcase you and celebrate you somewhere on the screen in a future video because you are awesome. To get some incredible Grant Cardone inspiration, check the video right there next to me. I think you'll love it. Continue to believe and I'll see you there. I told my wife when I got with her, I said, look, I'll do anything for you except one thing. I will not give up on that dream. If I got to surrender my dream, I'd rather be alone. Because if I abandon my dream, I'll abandon you. I truly believe that. I see so many people, man, they give up their dream for the wife.